nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I could ask you to remain standing. Uh, there was a major tragedy uh, last week with the school shooting at Parkland uh, in Florida. And I'd ask you all just to keep the uh, victims, their families, uh, and uh, frankly, school, children everywhere in your thoughts for a moment. Thank you. All right. Next item up on our agenda is to consider and act upon the minutes of regular meeting of January 17, 2018 and a special meeting of January 31st, 2018. Okay to take those together? Yes. yes. yes sure. I have a motion to accept. Motion made. A second. Second. Any comments or edits on the minutes? No. All right. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. All right, next up, some very special recognition for the Fairfield Ward Dance Team for finishing 10th in the nation uh, in the large hip hop division at the Universal Dance Association's National Dance Team. Could the coach or somebody from the team come up to the podium and fill us in on your program Hi. and the exciting competition you just won? And thank you for representing our town. Yes, of course. Thank you guys for having us. We're so excited to be recognized. Um, we went to nationals for could the first just, time. This you, could you just introduce yourself? Oh yeah, sure. Do you want me to face the camera? No, no. <laughs> 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 oh, you got me if, if, okay. yeah. if you face us, it's all taken right. care of for you. Got it. Okay. Uh, my name is Jennifer Keeley, and I've been coaching Fairfield Ward for 12 years. This is our 12th season, and this is the first time that we've ever gotten a bid to go to the high school nationals in Orlando. So we were very excited. Um, the girls have been training since May. They work very hard, four days a week, three to four hours of practice and um, they are really really good group of girls and we went to Orlando it was a four-day event they um, competed on Saturday we had to make it to finals on Sunday they competed against um, other teams they were announced to go into the finals and we competed on Sunday as well and then got placed tenth we are the first team to ever go to nationals for the first time and place in the top ten so we're wow. very proud of that. congratulations thank you <laughs> Any comments or questions no. from the I would just say thank colleagues. you for representing the town of Fairfield in Orlando, Florida. Uh, congratulations to finishing in the top ten. That is very remarkable. Uh, wish you luck in the future with next year's team. And uh, to the students here, thank your parents you know, for the yeah. sacrifices they've put through to, to get you there and all the practices and all that stuff they went through. So uh, congratulations. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Congratulations to the dancers, the coaches, the parents, the families, everyone that has worked so hard and for representing us so well. You, you've done great work at the state level, the regional level, and now the national level. That's something to be really proud of. And we're, we're training very, this week for states on Saturday, actually. Right. <laughs> so we're excited. We're very, very proud of you. So thank you and congratulations. Thank you. Yeah. Again, I echo my uh, colleagues' remarks and congratulations. A couple questions, though. Uh, there are cheerleading teams, gymnastics teams, dance teams, and hip-hop dance. Can you fill us in a little bit on how all this fits, and is there much overlap? Uh, well, those are three different, completely different sports. Gymnastics, <laughs> gymnastics. you know, they train yeah. individually on four different events, and um, cheerleading is more of a team sport, but they do so many different tricks and mm -hmm. stunting and mm -hmm. tumbling, whereas dance is about the synchronization, the bonding of the team, and how well they perform together in four different genres. In high school dance, you have kick line, hip hop, jazz, and palm. So there are four different divisions and four different types of rules for them to um, be looked at while they're performing. Okay, and how did you decide on hip hop as the genre? Well, hip hop has been our thing since 12 years ago. Uh, we started, um, we did hip hop our first year and then we started competing hip hop and jazz, but the hip hop division has just, our team has just been built around it. Uh, the girls work very hard on their tricks, stunting, those are huge things in hip hop. And uh, about four years ago when we won states for the first time, it's just, it's been our thing and everybody knows mm -hmm. that it's our thing. So, okay. and, we love and it. How many, how many girls on the team? We have 17. Okay. Yeah. And are you the only coach? 
I have two other people who assist me. They're not on um, full time, but yes, I have two other people. Okay, very good. Mm -hmm. Any other comments from the no, house? Nice. Okay, we do have certificates to hand out to each of the girls. Awesome. If we could. Excellent. Come on up, guys. You bet. So what we're going to do is, is we'll invite you up one at a time, uh, and then we'll have a whole big kind of group shot up here. Do we want to do this? Sure. Let's start with that. Let's go with uh, Lily Bubber. Barbara Nowski. All right. I needed help on it. Yeah, Lily. <laughs> Victoria Hermson. Front. 
Don't block the camera, yeah. It's fine, it's fine, Jay. Is it fine? No, sorry, I'll gets old no but back to business all right next item up on the agenda are two resignations for information only from the flood and erosion control board Steve Stearns a unaffiliate from 79 Oyster Road term of 11 15 to 11 20 and that resignation date is February 6 2018 and from the historic district commission uh, Rosina Negron unaffiliated from 952 Old Post Road her term was 11-16, 11-21, and that was an alternate term, and she resigned to serve as a full member. Her resignation date was February 5th, 2018. Um, in terms of reappointments, to here consider and act upon the following reappointment to the Flood and Erosion Control Board, Donald Lamberty, Republican, 75 French Street, for a term of 11-17 to 11-22. May I have a motion to accept? A motion. A second. Second. All right. Any comments? or uh, from the board? No, thanks for your willingness. Mr. Sir. Lamberty here? No. Oh, there we go. Good, okay. Thank you. Thank um, you for volunteering, sir. Thank you. All, right. All right, and again, thank you for your service, and certainly flood and erosion control in the era of Storm Sandy has taken on a whole new meaning for our entire town. So thank you for your efforts on our behalf there. Uh, any comments from the public? Dick, if it just come up to the podium? Good evening. I'm Dick Mahusky. I'm the chairman of the Flood and Erosion Control Board, and I just would uh, want to encourage you to uh, agree to the appointment of Don. He's been on Flood and Erosion for two years. He has served as our vice chairman, and he's very enthusiastic, interested, and he is our resident scientist for all those scientific matters that come to bear. Very good. Thank you. Any other comments from the public? Seeing none, back to the board. Are you ready to vote? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Congratulations, Don, and thank you. Thank you. All right, next <coughs> up, appointments. To here, consider and act upon the following appointments uh, to the Flood and Erosion Control Board. Rebecca G. <coughs> Bunnell, Democrat, 2005 Fairfield Beach Road for a term of 1115 to 1120, and this is to fill a vacancy for Stephen Stearns, who resigned. We have a motion to accept? So moved. A second? Second. Any comments from the board? No, thanks, Chair. Who wants to serve again? Right. Ms. Bunnell here? No. I don't see her at the moment. Okay. Any further comments from the board? Yeah. I had a chance to talk to uh, Rebecca or Becky, and uh, I'm very impressed with her background and her enthusiasm for getting involved on this board. Um, and I'm looking forward to uh, her contributions. And again, uh, Fairfield works really, um, a lot of our town government is driven by volunteers and their involvement on boards, and I can't tell you how important that is to our overall town for all these boards that folks are helping out. Um, any comments from the public? This is the last time I've come. I just want to uh, echo Mr. Tetro's recognition of Becky's enthusiasm. She's actually in Florida now. I hope she's doing some field research on matters relating to flooding <laughs> but her enthusiasm uh, she's going to be a good addition to our board and this will bring us back up to the full complement of five people so again I encourage you to uh, agree with this nomination thank you any further comments from the public seeing none back to the board are we ready to vote mm -hmm. all in favor aye. aye aye all right Becky in Florida congratulations and thank you for volunteering 
All right, next up, uh, to hear, consider, and act upon a uh, appointment to the Special Project Standing Building Committee. This requires RTM <coughs> approval. Rodney Van Dusen, Democrat, 157 Long Dean Road. And this is to fill a vacancy for Michael Giaquinto, who resigned. May I have a motion to accept? Make a motion. A second? Second. Right. Any comments from the board? I didn't get his resume in here. Okay. Mr. Van Dusen um, was recently appointed to the um, Smith Richardson Building Committee also and has served on the Town Facilities Planning Commission. I'm not sure there's, I don't see it either. Though I do believe it was in the packets when, uh, for the Smith Richardson Building Committee when he was appointed to that. And, I'd, uh, and if you'd like any comment, I know he served on the Town uh, Facilities Commission and was also involved in the review of the uh, golf uh, course and clubhouse okay. at the time. Was, and I think he was, <coughs> may have been chair of the subcommittee that looked at that and put together that report for the Town Facilities Commission. Okay. Secretary, actually. Secretary. Okay, thank you. Oh, yes, Rod? <laughs> yes. Are you sure about that, Rod? Yeah. <laughs> All right, uh, Mr. Van Dusen's here. If you have any questions of him specifically, okay. All right. Any other comments from the board? No, he's got a great background. Thanks for volunteering to serve again. All right. And we've had a couple of different phone calls now, so I appreciate your service, and it's been a pleasure talking to you. I'm looking forward to your skills uh, getting put together for the town here. Any comments from the public? Seeing none. Back to the board. All in favor? Aye. 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 Mr. Van Dusen, thank you. <laughs> All right, ne next up for the Strategic Plan Committee uh, to hear, consider, and act upon the following appointments. There are two. Okay to take them together? Sure. All right. uh, Patty Dyer, Democrat, 219 Toysom Hill Road, and Kristen <coughs> Tierney, unaffiliated, 263 Putting Green Road. May I have a motion to accept? So moved. A second? A second. All right, any comments from the board? I don't see the resumes in this packet either, and I just had one question. Okay. Were they part of the original list of um, candidates who applied? Yes, they were. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I had a chance. To, I had a chance to talk to them <coughs> in the original go round, and I've had a chance to recently catch up with them on this side. Um, I think that if you look at where we are in the strategic plan committee, we've just finished picking a consultant. I think the contract's getting signed. Mm -hmm. I think that. Um, this is a good time to get some different perspectives on. Now we've had a chance to kind of get that underway. It's taken a little bit longer to get to this point than I was hoping. Uh, but I think that the importance, and to me, one of the crucial points in this plan is community engagement. And I think getting uh, some different spokespeople and for different constituents is good in terms of balancing out the committee on that. So I think this is very helpful uh, from that standpoint. Any further comments from the board? Um, just a quick one. Um, we have two really qualified candidates here who have served our town well over the years, and I'm convinced that they will be a fantastic addition to this committee, and I, I look forward to working with them um, going forward. And any comments from the public? Seeing none, back to the board. Um, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, Patty, thank you, and is... Uh, I don't. I see Patty here. I don't see Kristen here. I, I didn't see her. Okay. Well, thank thank you again for volunteering. And your points well taken on the resumes and questionnaires. Those should be in each packet. Uh, and I will. Uh, and the committee breakdowns not in the packet this week either. But yeah. The two committees I mentioned. And both should be. So your points well taken. Let's find out why that is. I will follow up on that. Yeah, I would like to see the committee breakdowns. Mm -hmm. Can we get them for the next meeting? Uh, we can get them uh, ASAP to you. Okay. You have yes. <clears throat> for a strategic plan, was there another committee? Just the street plan committee. It was special one. projects and special projects. Mm -hmm. The flood and erosion was included. Right, that should be part of our packet as a standard item. 
So I'll follow up and make sure that that's included going forward. Uh, next up, item eight is a update from the Mill River Wetlands Committee. Uh, who is here to present us with the update? All right, please come up to the podium and introduce yourself and fill us in. My name is Lynn Shavinsky and I'm the president of the Mill River, Mill River Wetland Committee. Thank you for uh, letting me come here to just give you a brief update. This past year we celebrated our 50th anniversary. Um, we were started right here by Jocelyn Shaw, a Fairfield resident. She was out one day watching uh, what was going on near the Mill River and noticed a bulldozer clearing an area and asked them to please stop until she could further investigate what else um, the impact would be on the river and the organisms that live there. And from that experience sprung uh, the Mill River Wetland Committee and ultimately our most notable uh, project which is the River Lab project. So the River Lab program in its 50 years has um, taught over 100,000 students in the Fairfield Public and Parochial Schools. We have taken students out to uh, the river, to the Mill River and the Rooster River estuary uh, down at the beach and instilled uh, education, environmental education um, from the classroom into hands-on education. So since we can't actually take you out, I did bring some pictures <laughs> um, of what that looks like. So our mission is uh, specifically to educate students and adults about the watershed, to advocate for the maintenance of a healthy river basin system, and to engage the community in its protection. And in doing so, uh, these are just some examples of some of the things that we do through the program. We talk about um, habitats and how a river operates and how the rivers right here in Fairfield work in comparison to the rest of the world. We talk about absorbency and last year we did a whole series of rain garden uh, presentations with the library in conjunction with the library about how to build your own rain garden and how to maintain your own um, home area. We do, uh, we use scientific principles, and this is an example of using the water basin and the organisms that are found within the water, microscopic, <coughs> blow them up so that they look really scary on the board, <laughs> um, and talk about how important those little microorganisms are to the health and well-being of the entire river system. And this is at the estuary where we actually engage scientific principles in measuring water quality and productivity. Uh, over here are samples of some of the other things that we have been involved with over this past 50 years, more specifically last year. We helped with the Fairfield Board of Realtors to put in a beautification area at Rockland Park. It was an open space that was kind of used for dumping. And we went in and are using it as an educational location, not only for beautification, but also to talk about invasive versus native plants and how to, again, use rainwater or rain garden to be able to support the water basin system. We also do community walks um, with scout troops and with the community <coughs> to engage them in the same processes that we take the students through. So last year, uh, one of our uh, students who had grown and moved to California actually came back because she had written a book that she de dedicated to joy. And I think she sums up one of the key concepts of what we're trying to do in creating uh, children as environmental stewards to ultimately grow up to then uh, protect their environment. So her name is Sally Pla. She was a Fairfield resident, went through the system, came back and said this, I lived for those field trips, which got me out of an overstimulating classroom for me and instilled in me a reverence for birds and the wild that was so strong it inspired me to write the book, The Someday Birds. Today, more than ever, children need exactly that kind of direct, personal interaction with the natural world that MRWC provides. The work being done by MRWC is more than invaluable. I think it's crucial for both our children and our world. MRWC is planting quiet, important little seeds at a time when both nature and children need it more than ever. Who knows what wonders may sprout. Very good, and thank you. Any thank uh, you. questions or comments from the board? Uh, I would just uh, say I grew up playing and uh, hanging out on Mill River uh, as a kid. Now my kids are there. I take them down there. 
Uh, we catch fish in the same spots. I used to catch <laughs> fish, and it's you know this group which has helped preserve uh, Mill River to basically improve from when I was a kid to where it is now. So uh, it's a great family activity. If you want to take your kids on a hike and walk through Mill River, uh, I, I suggest you try it. If you haven't been there uh, and you're a Fairfield resident, uh, I think everybody should know about it. So I appreciate the work you do. Mr. Kiley. Certainly. Um, thank you for everything you do, all the education that you provide, and for creating those environmental stewards that the world will need down the road. It's very important. And the reach of your program across town is tremendous. The, the numbers of programs, the, the number of uh, families that are affected, um, yet um, bringing everyone into a better understanding of not just in Mill River, but our, enti our, our entire environment around us. So it's really great work. Thank you. Thank you. Lynn, and thank you. And obviously programs don't exist without good leadership, and thank you for what you're doing for the program here. Though, in listening to your comments, you were you're kind enough to say that uh, Joy asked the bulldozer to stop. <laughs> the version I heard is she stood in front of it and made it stop. Well, she the, uh, stood in front of it and made, made it stop. stop. Yes. Uh, you know, uh, giving 100,000 kids that experience is just speaks to both the longevity and the popularity of the program and the value that you add to our town. So thank you. I had a chance to be at Rockland Park when it was opened mm -hmm. up and it just it's a great addition to the neighborhood there. And when you look at Mill River and look at all the ways different things come together, uh, certainly uh, many of you have heard of the Exide Battery Factory and the cleanup we did through Mill River. Uh, and in talking to the neighbors around there, uh, they are mentioning now that the fish life has come back dramatically in Mill River, so much so they're starting to see bald eagles uh, in the neighborhood. Uh, so I think that will give you more than enough uh, very wildlife to uh, comment on going forward, but thank you for your work in terms of teaching uh, our community an appreciation for what Mill River means. Thank you. All right, next up, item nine. From the superintendent of schools, and this requires RTM approval to hear, consider, and act upon the following resolution as requested by the Superintendent of Schools. Resolved that the Town of Fairfield authorizes the Town of Fairfield's Board of Education to apply to the Commissioner of Education to accept or reject a grant for the Mill Hill Elementary School renovation project at Mill Hill Elementary School. And further resolved that the Mill Hill Elementary School Building Committee is hereby established as the Building Committee with regard to the Mill Hill Elementary School renovation project at Mill Hill Elementary School and further resolved that the Town of Fairfield hereby authorizes at least the preparation of schematic drawings and the outline of specifications for the Mill Hill Elementary School renovation project at Mill Hill Elementary School. May I have a motion to accept? So moved. A second. Second. All right, thank you. Uh, the superintendent or somebody want to fill us in a little bit on what this is about? Mr. Cullen? Tom Cullen, Executive Director of Operations. So the resolutions before you are the uh, exactual readings we need to submit to the State of Connecticut for reimbursement for this project. And the first part of the project is the request for the uh, project team initial funding, or what is known as the seed money. This will put the team together, the building committee, uh, to come up with schematic designs, estimates, construction manager figures, uh, to give us a better number of what we're looking at for Mill Hill Elementary School project. So um, at the last Board of Selectmen meeting, this was tabled for us to provide you more information. That was in January 31st. Uh, we provided a letter to you on February 13th, including information for this project. Um, the letter is uh, related to Sherman and Mill Hill, but the Mill Hill related items are the Ed spec and probably the last item, which is the Malona McBroom reports, uh, the enrollment reports and studies we've been doing in October. Yeah. I think we'll get to the project so with the next item. I didn't for the funding. Yep. Yeah. Just for just in terms of getting through these three, so we get that sure. done. Mm -hmm. uh, one quick question. I know that <coughs> it makes sense that we provide seed money so that we have some way of of hiring an architect and getting the schematic stuff. So that logically that makes sense. Question I had uh, from a resident was. How long have we been using seed money in, in projects? How long have we used that approach? Has that been forever, or is that something no. we in, innovated 
more recently. No, that was a new item we brought in with Dr. Title, who was here, this previous superintendent of schools. Okay. And do you know a date, though? It was, uh, Sorry, yeah, come on and talk. Yeah, I don't mean it's not a so, quiz. I just, no, as long as you were here, I was going to get the answer. question. Uh, Sal Morbido, manager of construction, security, and safety. I've been here since 2006. First large project that I was on was Strathfield, and that's where I first saw the seed money. It kind of seemed like it was a new um, process at that time to so me. That was completed in 2013, so it started in 2011. It's actually 2007. Now, it seems to make sense as I'm listening because it. This basically says we're authorized to go ahead with schematics, but it's the architect who's going to draw the schematics, as I understand it. Correct. And we have to hire the ar architect, so we're going to have to get some money to pay him to do that. So this all kind of flows with what these, have these three resolutions been around forever, or are these relatively new in terms of the state approval process? Yes. Uh, I'm sorry, it came back. Uh, <laughs> state approval process has uh, had the three resolutions probably at least the last 20 years. Okay. Um, they've reformatted them recently, about two years ago, uh, to the uh, format that you have now. Um, but they've been there. Same three okay. topics. All right. Thank you. I don't mean to belabor the point. No. I just want to take advantage of your presence, guys. Thank you. <clears throat> Any other questions from the board on on the? Yeah, so, yeah, I I do, and I just want. I'm a little. Uh, confused on the order. I think we should be voting for the grant after we vote for the project because if I don't choose to vote for the project and it passes, I would vote for the grant. Obviously, I'd want the state money to do that. And I have questions regarding the project, not questions regarding the grant. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. Do you want to, is that a motion to table this and come back to it after we review the whole project? If you guys are, um, that's fine. I'm happy to do that. Yeah. I'm okay with that. Is okay. that Mr. Coleman, I assume the sequence doesn't uh, impact you at all if we take the project right now, which you were kind of starting to get into anyway? Are you talking about the grant in item 10? Yes. For the mm -hmm. funding? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Taking yeah. 10 before right. 9. So what we do is, in essence, table 9. Fine. Go on to discuss 10 now and then come back to 9? That'd be fine. All right. Okay. Sure. Thank you. So um, I have a, mo let's see, let me go through item 10. Uh, first of all, um, I have a motion to table item 9. So move. So, second. All right. All in favor? Aye. 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 The item is tabled. Uh, item 10, Superintendent of Schools. This requires Board of Finance and RTM approval. To hear, consider, and adopt a bond resolution entitled, A Resolution Appropriating $1.5 Million for the Costs Associated with the Planning, Design, and Obtaining Cost Estimates for the Renovation and Expansion of Mill Hill Elementary School and the Cost of Relocation of Temporary Classrooms installed at Mill Hill Elementary School and authorizing the issuance of bonds to finance such appropriation. May I have a motion to accept? I'll make a motion. A second? Second. All right. That item is now before us. And Mr. Cullen, if I can, uh, in looking at the material that you provided this time around, I want to thank you very much. That was a very complete Welcome. package and, and uh, gave me plenty to review before this meeting. Yeah. Uh, but was very thorough. And thank you very much for doing yeah, it. I think we wanted to show you that we've done a lot of work with Malone and McBroom. So those reports were big, but uh, that's a lot of the work we've been doing with our board and okay. on the enrollment and the capacity deficiency right. of the schools. So we'll leave it to you to, to step us through the material in a sequence okay. you think is most appropriate, okay. if that's okay with the board. Sure. Yeah. So I was mentioning that the, the letter I provided of February 13th uh, was to provide information and backup that came from this meeting, mm -hmm. meeting on mm -hmm. January 31st. The ones that pertain to Mill Hill would be uh, item three, which is uh, provide Board of Ed approved educational specifications for the Mill Hill Elementary School renovation in addition capital project. So we did in fact uh, very quickly meet with the Board of Ed, um, had a healthy discussion about the Ed specs for Mill Hill, uh, and then at their second meeting um, got a received approval of those Ed specs. Mm -hmm. So we revised those Ed specs, uh, stamped them approved, and provided you a copy of those for the project and for the building committee team. Okay. Any questions? I've got one, if that's okay with the board. Sure, sure. On page two, under enrollment, uh, this says, uh, this report shows a continued increase in, in enrollment from Mill Hill to a peak of 384 students. Um, I know we've gone back and forth uh, on whether one of the questions coming out of last meeting was just how big a school are we uh, asking to be built here. I thought I saw 504. 
in some of the on page two items. I'm just looking for where that is. Page four. Thank you. Under the project description. Okay. Can if the peak is 482, can you just fill us in on why we're building to or 384? Can you fill us in on why we're building to 504? I think page seven has functional capacity and enrollment mm -hmm. all on the same chart. Hi, Tony Jones, school superintendent. Um, part of building to a 504 is decision that that came previously. Obviously, when we were talking about Holland Hill, I believe from the board of selectmen, it wasn't here at the time, but also from board of finance, and it was looking at how do we utilize all of our schools effectively. Um, and you'll notice in those Malone and McBroom reports that we've given you, we've looked at um, how we would redistrict in the future, possibly in order to uh, take care of overcrowding in certain schools. How could we deal with the racial imbalance um, issue that we have at McKinley and they have applied Malone and McBroom has various scenarios where it would actually move children around the district um, going forward if we were building to a 504 in order to not be expanding in well and we can't really at Sherman which you know which is that capacity um, to be able to look at how we could migrate those children around the district um, in order to use our facilities effectively. And then our facility plan and working with Malone and McBroom identifies that um, we don't seek 100% capacity when we design to a 504. <coughs> the, um, the proper capacity is somewhere around 85% uh, to deal with um, other functions that are going on with the curriculum and the students in the school and the smaller spaces that are needed. Yeah, I think I've, I've, you've taken us through that in the past and talked about the 85 to 90% right. is kind of the target rate for doing that. The, that would be about 450. It's just the 384 seems somewhat below that. So what you're saying is you're basically building excess capacity here to allow you the flexibility to redistrict and make adjustments at other schools in, in the, the future. future. Right. And the 504 also takes care of the deficiencies that are already in the building. Um, Mill Hill is a small building. It doesn't have, um, it has a very small, you know, cafeteria. It has uh, fewer classrooms um, for small spaces. So the 504 actually also meets the ed spec, which, you know, we had a lot of discussion about the ed spec last spring. Yeah. yeah. And that's, mm -hmm. uh, doesn't have the amount of small spaces that our other elementary schools have. They average 17 to 24 small spaces. Mill Hill has 10. So it doesn't have the flexibility of even the small spaces to move things yeah, around. I saw that on one of the charts. Thank mm -hmm. you for, for including that. Any right. other comments on this? Let's start with the specs, I guess. Yeah. Uh, I would piggyback off what you just said. Um, and I guess my question is, we just did Holland Hill at a 504. Why wouldn't we take this opportunity <coughs> to do, now that we've upgraded three schools, Mill Hill, Osborne, and Holland Hill, why wouldn't we take this opportunity to make that uh, town-wide assessment of where we're at to see if you can fit what, what you mentioned um, earlier to see I, I mean, my concern is overbuilding right now to the 504 level at this particular school especially when the case is being made by McClone Mc Mc and Broom that there's no need right now for a 504 and especially in the next five years uh, so that's that's I would actually refer you to the Malone and McBroom report from uh, 2016 because part of the racial imbalance plan that we've put forward to the state does require the 504 at Holland Hill and Mill Hill in order to make that work for the entire district. Um, and it, I know Mr. Dwyer always gives a great description of it looking like a clock and you're moving literally children counterclockwise around the district um, and trying to have minimal impact also how many children you're moving at one time. Um, but in that report, it does rely on Mill Hill as a 504. Yeah, it identifies the capacity deficiencies and all based on the ed spec of a 504. And at that time, were they taking into consideration Holland Hill being a yes, 504? Yes. Uh, and Riverfield. It was, you mentioned uh, Mill Hill. It was Riverfield <coughs> and Holland Hill now that are. So, what I'm hearing is all of our schools eventually should be in the 504. You're planning on redistricting after the Mill Hill renovation or looking at redistricting. Uh, to fix the racial imbalance. So I would, I would weigh that as a numerical question. Financially, how many millions of dollars are we gonna spend 
to satisfy the racial imbalance to overbuild these schools um, versus I, doing that study right now to right. save millions of dollars. I would really, I would encourage you to look at all three of those reports that are in your packet because I think if you go in and start looking at the charts, you'll see that we are at capacity. And I think where sometimes it, it it gets a little tricky is when you think you have 21 classrooms or 24 class with 24 classrooms with 21 children. They don't all have 21. Some of them are going to have 20, some of them may have 19 because we don't know at what grade level children are going to move in and we can't say every grade level is going to have exactly X amount of students and so the way you use classroom space, if you were at 100%, you would, we would be back to looking at trailers which is also something that this community has said they wanted to phase out. So uh, you mentioned 21, I thought it was 24 in a class. Not at elementary, 21. Yeah, it's not at elementary school. No, middle school and high school it goes up. Now I think what you're talking about, you're talking about two different things. One is looking at how we get to the 504. It's X amount of classrooms times X amount of children. That's the average number of students we would see in a classroom. It's not the guidelines necessarily that I am using as a school superintendent where if we get to 21 students in fourth grade, for instance, yes, we can add another student. We can have more students in that. But the way we calculate the capacity, and there are many different ways to calculate capacity, the board spent over an hour at least yeah. just talking about this a few weeks ago um, but looking at the 504 it's taking the average which is 21 and applying that across the building to all of your classrooms general education classrooms so we do the average not in a, in a situation you would move it up to 22 if you had to right well we would yes our guidelines are not that you can't go past 21 that's how you get to the 504 and it's taking the average number of students we would expect because some classrooms will have 24 some may have 19 so you've got to look at how you fill your building it means every room is still full but they're not necessarily because they're not like little marbles you can just place you know in different jars so they're actually children that show up on all different grades and we unfortunately never know you know where that's going to happen Whoops. Well, and my, my concern is I think there's a big difference between building a 504 because everything in the school has got to get bigger. Like I mentioned at the last meeting, you need a bigger cafeteria, you need everything there. So when we talk about overbuilding, you know, we're overbuilding an entire school and, you know, we're talking about another domino down, the, down in the future based upon redistricting what I heard to fill that to get to the 504 number. Well, you these projections don't, right. don't come, they're, 100, they're over 100 students away from the 504. Right, so so you have to have a plan for the whole district. You can't just look at one building in isolation and especially when you have a building like Sherman that we can't you know, I expand there. Um, if we wanted to have 800 children sometime by the beat, you can't do that. So not only just the land capacity, but obviously the FEMA regulations. And you have to look at the whole district and how you can maximize the facilities that we have. And if you look at the studies that are in the packet, um, you know, they're, they're fairly clear and the capacity is very high. And the other thing that Malone and McBroom have done for us is that not only are, is the birth rate staying fairly stable, but we also know from, pre, from the studies we've been doing over the last 12 months that we're having a high move-in rate uh, between that birth and kindergarten. So their projections <coughs> going forward, um, they feel very solid about. I have a whole bunch of other questions on their projections and I would actually prefer to ask them those questions on how they came up with this uh, and whether they took into, the, into fact the state of Connecticut population is declining, the town of Fairfield lost residents. Uh, actually we didn't. No, I remember seeing that report. And I, uh, uh, and yeah, I, just, I just published it my blog from the U.S. Yeah, Census we Board to show that we've got five yeah, years of in continuing <laughs> growth. <laughs> how did we do last year? I remember seeing it was like a a small drop right? through the u.s census okay. they it, it, you can we can certainly invite them here sure uh all right but I, I, but chris to your point i think that um you know sometimes one again thank you again for providing all this information uh some of this is relevant to the school project right. at hand and some of this is relevant district. to overall understanding that the overall concept and plan of the board of ed right. um i think often those those presentations are made at the Board of Ed level. <coughs> right. I'm going to suggest that maybe, uh, in response to some of Chris's questions, yeah. that we get that presentation here 
Sure. Um, and I don't know if it's appropriate to have the folks that did the projections here, if that's possible. Or, they did a really <laughs> great presentation at our last meeting. So I will forward you that link so you can watch that. Okay. Um, it was well over an hour, and mm -hmm. they answer a lot yeah. of those questions. Right. But to, to help us all get yeah. a handle on, on what the thinking is, what the approach is, how these things are balanced. Because mm -hmm. as you point out, it's not just about this school. It's right. about the overall district plan. I think it might be helpful to have that presentation from you and your team before sure. this board uh, in March, in one of our March meetings. I'd like to see that. D does the board currently have a district plan for redistricting? We do not have an actual redistricting plan because until you actually get Holland Hill built and we get <coughs> Mill Hill, um, then you would do that work after that as you're looking at how many kids are at each building, or is the growth coming in exactly as projected because your projections go out five years. Even though we do ten, you always feel really good about the first five. The, the second five are always more challenging. And we will get to that um, once the the projects are in place in order to even think about making a plan work. But part of the answer, I think, to Chris's question would be some of the scenarios. As I, look, as I read oh, through absolutely. these, you laid out A, B, C, D. Mm -hmm. There's a lot. Was there an E? E, F. I think there was <laughs> an F. Okay. Yeah. Well, I, got, I got through D. Yeah. Uh, but I think that, that they lay off the different scenarios, which is not, it's not a, this is what we're going to do, but it's a, here's different options that we might look at, mm -hmm. including closing down Dwight and some other uh, things that were referenced in there. Right. And some things that might not happen. Right. Uh, Correct. So I think right. that it would probably be healthy for this board, A, to know what you've talked through right. so we can kind of follow along with you. And that might help us uh, be in a better position to uh, see projects coming down the road as you look at those. Sure. Absolutely. Would that help? Uh, that would absolutely help. Uh, well, one of my, the reality is redistricting is very difficult. It's a political nightmare. Uh, nobody wants to move schools. Uh, and as we continue to over, not to build at 504 level, I mean, eventually everybody's going to say, well, they got to stay in their neighborhood. And now I'm being told to move. Why didn't you build my school to that level too? And the easier thing to do is keep spending the money until we actually have the plan in place. I think it's hard to commit without, because it's millions of dollars, the difference between a 504 and the next level and, and, and below that. Uh, in my view, it's hard to commit that much more money for a plan which one isn't in place and two maybe politically uh, impossible to do. Well and I, I might take us back to the actual project that's in front of you because it's seed money and part of that seed money is to really be able to look at what's possible at Mill Hill you know what is that cost driver going to be uh, according to the market now what's happening with the land that's why the seed money is so important so that you can study all of those issues now while we have Malona McBroom plans that show redistricting and it and just you know for clarity it doesn't just redistrict one school or one smaller school it's pretty much kind of 20 percent and it's pretty equal around the district um, if, is that the plan that the board will choose I could never speak for our previous board obviously but um, there will be many different options according and you can see those in the scenarios um, mm -hmm. as much as we saw those in the scenarios and again yeah. thank you for providing that um, did you just say that the because what I didn't see in the spec is an evaluation within the by the uh, building committee, the architect, or anybody else, in terms of whether 504 is the right number or a smaller number is the right number. Did you? Did I misunderstand what you just said? Well, Malone and McBroom, right now, if you're looking at going out into the future, racial imbalance plan relies on a 504 at Holland Hill and Mill Hill. So if we decided that that's not the plan that the board will be looking at in two years, for whatever reason, let's say the seed money comes back and there's something un unanticipated, um, and the board has to look at this again at a different size, it would have other impacts around the district. And it could be another one of those scenarios. It could be, um, it, well, it could be a, a number of things. It would take a whole other study by Malone and McBroom to really go in and look at facilities. It just <coughs> so we're clear as to where we are right now. Yes. What's before us is an ed spec that says, please build this to 504. That's correct. Okay. So there's not, it's not a question right now. That's the plan. That is the plan. Okay. All right. Thank you. Design it. Right. Design it, right. Yeah. right. Just any any just follow Just quickly on that topic there, I certainly support the idea of getting a full um, presentation to this board so that we can best understand, you know, the global capacity issues, right? Because when you look at just one school at a time, you miss some of these other components that 
are part of other options, other scenarios, and that have and that depend on all these factors. Some of them we know, some of them we don't yet know, right? You know, from from sitting on committees over the years, and from the one night that we, the couple of meetings we had with the subcommittee that I was on a few months back, and we got to see some potential scenarios during those meetings. You know, one of the things that was um, for me most difficult to understand was the migration, right? People moving into our town. Because the fact is, people are moving into our town. They might be moving out of Connecticut, but they're moving into our town. And I think that's a good thing. But it's hard to measure that, it's hard to predict that, and it's hard to know what that will mean to you, not just next year, but two, four, six years down the road. So having a, a, a clearer global understanding of as much of that as we possibly can, I think would better, would help me better understand what this means at 504 combined with this one at 504 and this one so that we have enough excess capacity or capacity so that you have enough options down the road to address you know our children's needs the racial imbalance and other facilities issues that are going to come up over the years so you know thank you for that in advance um as we're looking at this, one of the things that, that I was intrigued by, this calls for a six bus queue. And, and not that I mean to argue over whether it should be five, six, or seven, I'm just intrigued that there's enough of an understanding of the site plan to know how many buses might be in the queue on this. How, how, does, how does that level of detail get arrived at at, at yeah, this we, level? We're hopeful that with the project team and the building committee, they'll do a traffic study. There has been some concern from the public that live in that area that it is a very taxed location uh, as far as vehicles and buses and parents coming and going. Mm -hmm. and, and certainly that's some of the feedback we've heard in emails, yep. at least I have. Yeah. Uh, a little bit. So, and again, when you say you're hopeful they'll do a traffic study, is there a traffic study called for in the edge spec? How do we, how do we make sure that happens? No, but I think in the, in the request, the project request in your booklet, Now you gave us a bunch of booklets, Tom, so you're going to have to tell yes, us which booklet it is. Yes, it would be this one. Okay. <laughs> um, and is that normal for a school project, yes. or would that be something exceptional for this one? No, we would, we've done traffic studies for the Ludlow campus, Tomlinson, any place that uh, seems to be a difficult site. Uh, so it is on page 11 in the details under architect engineering consultants about halfway down one of the bullets is traffic and signing consultant it's up in the top portion where the bullets are ah okay sorry traffic and signage consultant okay and that so that's meant to include a traffic study for the surrounding neighborhood? Correct. And to look at the bus loop, look mm -hmm. at where the parent drop-off and um, pickup is, uh, so that it works well with the site and any addition that's being put onto the building. Okay. Is that, is that enough of a definition so the building committee knows what to do? I think, I think so. so. Okay. I think so. And I'm, I think I'll Sal and I, when we first addressed the building committee, we mm -hmm. will definitely talk about that. Is, is that pretty standard boilerplate type language that you would have seen at Holland Hill at this stage of the process is this based on that or is it based on a specific need at that site no we had the need at Holland Hill too it, it has a very narrow drive uh, where the buses pull in and how the parents are supposed to get around the buses and mm -hmm. where the staff <coughs> park all happening in a 20 minute time frame in the morning and at pickup right so it would that I get but my question there. is as far as you know um, uh, defining the question, if you will, and making sure that the traffic study is included and that the other issues that need to be studied are included. It, are we putting forward the same type of process in language <coughs> here as we did with Holland Hill? And I, I see Mr. Quinn in the back nodding his yes. head. Yes. So that the direction we gave them that satisfied those needs is similar to the direction that you're putting forward at this point now. Yes. Is yes. that fair to say? Yes, it is. Okay. Okay. I've got another question, but should I uh, so let me jump in, do one, go back to the sure. maybe come back to it. Yep. Okay. Um, I, I, 
I'm still wrapping my head around the 504 situation and, and the enrollment numbers from McLeod and Broome have townwide the students going down for the next five years. Uh, and to me, I look at that and I say, what's the rush to do the 504 now when you have the flexibility? And then what's the success rate of McLeod and McBroom's projection numbers <coughs> being correct with kids who haven't been born yet? What's their track record on their being successful in, in accurately assessing assessing yeah. that? So, and well, that you, would you, I would ask McLeod that. Sure, your first question I would tell you that any, and there's a building committee chairman here, but any large school project takes about five years from start to finish. So the fact that we might be five years out with the enrollment projections, um, this project has to be planned now to plan for five years what's going to happen. And it's certainly Malone and McBroom can answer uh, the question, your second questions. Okay. Um, one of the other things we've been doing a lot more of is solar panels. And I noticed that in, in the roofing system, it talks about uh, single membrane or multi multiply membrane. Um, are we looking at solar panels for this school? Uh, it has solar panels. It's a fairly new roof that we did um, with a non-recurring project of, uh, maybe four years ago. Three years ago. Three years ago. And then we did do a solar system on okay. that roof. So our only concern there would be if a building committee and project team looked at the school and um, so maybe cool. decide as an option as a second floor. Go up there. Uh, do a second story on that site. If it's a difficult site, then we would be concerned <coughs> about having a brand new roof and solar on it. Certainly the structural system isn't going to support a second floor. So they'd have to weigh those costs against an addition that would spread out on the property. Okay. So mm -hmm. when it specifies mm -hmm. roofing systems shall be multiply systems, 20-year warranty, they're talking about if we need to do the roof, not we're not planning to do the roof. Or right? a new roof on an addition. Okay. If there's a new addition put on, we certainly want a multiply system. But there is an approach that says we since we just redid the roof, we're not redoing the roof again. Correct. Okay. Just quickly on that, what percentage of our power are we generating today at Mill Hill through the solar panel systems that are currently there? I didn't bring that with me, but I have Just it. ballpark? I do, I do have it for I mean, is it, is it 20% or is it 80%? Uh, it's small. It, it's small. It's probably about 10. It's about 10? 8 or 10%. Oh, okay. Yeah. So it, it's that small. Yeah. Is that because of it's the amount of roof space available or? Yeah. Real estate available, yes. Real estate available? Yeah. We, okay. we wanted the, the, uh, the, the rooftop mounted unit to be on uh, the new roof. The mm -hmm. new roof was on the uh, <coughs> south wing of the building, not the whole building. Mm -hmm. So we're limited in real estate on that. Yeah, we okay. only like to put the solar systems on the roofs where we have new roofs. Uh, then we get the life out of the roof, we right. get the extra protection of the solar, and we don't have to worry about it for a very long time. Right. All right. Any you. further questions on the Ed spec? I would, yes. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> is the Board of Ed firmly behind this Ed spec? Because I heard some questions and those questions in the meeting about whether the, the ed spec may change uh, throughout this process? Let's see. Uh, Phil Dwyer, Chairman of the Board of Education. Uh, the ed spec was approved on an 8-0 vote. One of our members was out of town, so therefore was not uh, in attendance. So it was a unanimous vote of those that were present. <clears throat> um, at a minimum, I believe that you really need this school at 21 classrooms at a minimum in order to provide the headroom and to provide for the 10-year enrollment projection. So then the question is, will it be in Fairfield's best interest while we have everybody there and the mobilization costs and the construction costs, what is the actual cost of adding those three extra classrooms? Uh, if it were me, I would tell the architect to design to 504 and perhaps ask for a deduct alternate that if the project got too expensive, uh, deduct three classrooms. Then you would know exactly what that, that cost of three classrooms are and could decide at that time with this cost and planning for the future, should we have them? Um, and so we had that debate within the uh, Board of Ed and the Board of Ed said we ought to, in a planning <coughs> grant, uh, go forward with 504 and if the building committee came back to us and said, for good and just reasons, et cetera, 
uh, we would ask you to uh, take a look at that number again. We would, but we think that 504 is the right number, uh, not only for that school, but for our, uh, Sherman is at 112% capacity. Uh, it's not uh, if we redistrict, but because of overcapacity in a couple of elementary schools, we really do have to F forget about the state issues. Just uh, over capacity at other elementary schools, we are going to have to shift. Um, and so that gives us the flexibility to do that. Um, so I would strongly encourage that for the planning grant that you go forward at 504, let the building committee uh, evaluate it, and then when they bring forth a funding proposal okay. for the whole project, um, see where we stand. So it was voted unanimously. And we had discussion, should we stay at 504? And the answer was yes. So you know, I'm hearing that. Uh, I appreciate the logic that goes in that. One of my concerns is that option takes away, I mean, you're talking about a future plan which isn't in place. If the boards decide that a 504 is not necessary and we're going to go with the cheaper, the less expensive option to build it to 21 classrooms, then we're not making a decision based upon population. We're making a financial decision at that to, at that point. Um. Today I'm being told based upon population and a future plan, yeah. I need to build this at 504 and we're spending X amount of dollars to do that. If the option exists for the board to re-look at another option, we're asking the and I don't remember seeing that in that spec, um, look at an option which has it at a 21 classroom and give us the price difference, then it's actually not being built based upon population, it's being based up, built upon cost at that point. It, uh, it would not be built according to how the Board of Education believes it should be, but it's not the first time that the, the town bodies, Board of Selectmen, Board of Finance, and RTM have said we need to take cost into consideration and uh, balance the one with the other. So um, uh, we are not suggesting that um, we will quickly go to 21 classrooms. Uh, 462, I think, is the number. Uh, because I don't think the Board of Ed would. They would want to stay at 504. But if push came to shove and the only way the town feels that they could afford it was to, uh, using the term value engineer, to say we need to cut back here, we need to cut back there, as <coughs> our esteemed multi-building committee chair knows full well, <laughs> you get a number in and then you have to kind of adjust. So we would be prepared to adjust if the building committee felt that that was the only way to, quote, afford a project. But we do believe 504 is the right number and would hope that the numbers will come in to support that. Because we do believe that um, these buildings are built for 30 years, even though we have 10-year projections. And um, I have no doubt that 30 years ago, the school districts had no clue as to the amount of specialized instruction space they might need or the new instruction models that were required. Um, and I have no doubt that 30 years from now, um, we will uh, also have space demands. And so uh, I would say while we're building those three extra classrooms, I don't think would be that much more of a marginal increase. It will be some, but that's a number that I think you can get through the bid process and know exactly what the, what the real cost of those extra three would be. I think 21 is pretty much the minimum in order to give the headroom in future planning and allow the redistricting so that we can uh, prevent overcrowding at a couple of other schools. I don't know whether that, that does, the look on your face suggests that you're not convinced, but that was the Board of Ed's lo logic. And that goes to my, that goes to my overall concern about overbuilding. I do want to see Mill Hill uh, renovated. Uh, the numbers I have in front of me from McBroom, uh, McBroom don't, don't indicate that a 504 is necessary. I'm taking a leap of faith, which I'm uncomfortable taking, that the board is going to come up with a redistricting plan, which is going to be agreed upon. Uh, and I really would like to get a sense of that or have a townwide <coughs> discussion before we commit millions and millions and millions of dollars to a 504 when it may or may not be needed uh, in the future. Uh, I do want to see the uh, portable classrooms out of there. I do want to see the uh, school updated and renovated. I'm just, uh, I'm leery of a 20 million 
$22 million number versus a $14 million number. <coughs> and that's what I'm wrestling in my head right now. Uh, so. Yeah, between the, um, in the waterfall chart from last fall, between the planning grant and the uh, placeholder construction grant, it's about twenty million two fifty is what's in the waterfall chart between those two numbers. Yeah, that the highest caution would be that um, the initial estimates have been considerably under uh, what we have eventually built the schools for. As much as once we go out to bid, we do finish them on time and on budget. I don't mean to suggest <coughs> that. Yeah. But until we get the final construction drawings in and get it out to bid and get real numbers back, um, it's hard to estimate that. And we have been off considerably um, through nobody's fault, but we have been off uh, considerably. Uh, there's some question, and there's a number of scenarios in here. Is it back to technical or board well, policy? I, I don't know. You can you can listen and then decide if okay. it is. Um, there are a number of scenarios in here, which I think what Mr. Timniak was trying to get at. Um, our, our, is there a time frame for choosing one or two or three of those scenarios in terms of what are the most likely? Um. <laughs> we, um, uh, we have two time frames. Um, one uh, suggested by the state and one suggested by the practical construction of Mill Hill. Um, uh, for 10 years, the state has been anxious for us to um, uh, comply with the state law regarding racial imbalance. We have uh, pushed that off with different scenarios as how we might solve it. At the principal um, request of the McKinley's, uh, the families at McKinley, um, uh, it is the most racially balanced school in our system. 50% Caucasian, 50% all other. It's a wonderful school. But the state continues to put us under a plan, which we are required to get back to them in the spring of 19 with a definitive, what are you going to do? Uh, their first interest is redistricting. Uh, if we could uh, create a viable magnet program that would draw uh, families into McKinley that would change the balance, because we're only off about two, three percent. Um, uh, so one of those two are probably the most viable to go back to them in the spring of 19. Their preference is redistricting and to bring all of our schools down to 15 percent, below 15 percent versus at 28 percent, which is where McKinley is now. And the only way you could really do that is through redistricting. If you called up the state, I think they would say, we are expecting the board to say we are committed to redistricting and take that vote in the spring of 19. The other date, you really can't create a, re a new redistrict and say, by the way, here's what the new districts will be, but we won't implement them for four years. Because four years, the demographics of different streets and different neighborhoods will change. Um, and so pretty much, once you decide to redistrict uh, philosophically, uh, then you would need a couple of years of both study and community input and convincing them that uh, this made sense um, for, uh, to create a real plan and then implement it the following spring. So there's kind of a decision date, <coughs> spring of 19, and an implementation date, which would come in com coordination with opening uh, Mill Hill. Does that answer your question? It was his question. I'm sorry, his first selectman question. Yeah, but I was asking it for Chris, just because. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so spring uh, 19, so, and, and so from a timing standpoint, uh, the original seed funding we get, the, the study time, um, that study is going to be done after we're done with the seed money and pretty much have a plan in place to move forward. I think those two dates can uh, coordinate because then the building committee will have gone far enough along to um, have a better set of information as to costs and and what design can be put in there. Okay. So I would say why not start the plan now and find out what school you need to move to a 504 if you need to. I mean the whole thing is it's satisfying, right? We're satisfying the state racial imbalance, which has been an issue for how many years? 
since 2007. Okay, since 2000, for 10 years, the state's essentially been asking us to redistrict, okay, and we haven't taken step one towards that, <coughs> right? We have taken several steps toward coming into compliance with their regulation, and uh, I think in one year we were. So uh, I think the phrase, we have avoided redistricting okay. is a correct statement, but we have taken several steps to try and bring the school into compliance with their state regulation. All right, so we've taken steps to, we've avoided redistricting, and now we're faced with the certainty of redistricting based upon what you're saying by next spring, 2019. Because it's in com combination with there are um, uh, over capacity at two specific elementary schools and others that are in the 90s and so you just you, forget uh, what that's what I meant but to say forget the state even if the state was not there this school district is going to have to deal with the question of redistricting just to rebalance the the functional utilization of all 11 elementary schools in how many years have we been over capacity in specific schools without looking at the redistricting then? No. Just looking at the... Uh, there's two or three that have gone up or down, but... Um, how many are now? Right now, I believe we have two. Two. That two are over right. capacity. Yeah, yeah well, <laughs> superintendent yeah. said we have to count Mill Hill too, so it's three. <laughs> So I guess what I'm saying is we, we, we've had an overcrowding problem for multiple years. We've had a racial imbalance problem for multiple years. Uh, I'm being told that in the spring of 19, we're going to look at redistricting. In the meantime, go ahead, build this at 504. We may or may not need it at 504. The board will definitely look at it. We'll get a value price engineering at some point to determine what we want based upon financial dollars, not based upon population. At some point, we're going to sprinkle back a redistricting plan, which will take multiple years of study, input, all that stuff to satisfy the state. In the meantime, we're going to have a 504 school up and running uh, under capacity by over by over a hundred and you know 115 students for based upon these projections during that same time frame. Uh, for multiple years uh, to do that. And that's where I go back to my thing, why not do the study first and then figure out what we need to build to. Um, and I'm suggesting that a planning grant for that school, the study has already been done by Malone and Maroon and said, in order to, to uh, redistrict, for the two reasons I mentioned, um, because we have to get better utilization and not be over capacity at several schools or very close to capacity at other schools um, and the state's expectation uh, you should redistrict they haven't recommended that but they've said based on the data we see it would make sense for you to take a serious look at that and if you did this is how you, these are different scenarios that you might use to uh, to accomplish that um, and, again, and so the planning grant um, uh, a lot, and the, so they've recommended that in order to do that, you really have to have both Holland Hill and Mill Hill, Hill at 504. Right. And so the planning grant, I think, gives us the opportunity to take a serious look at it. And um, as I said, the Board of Ed would prefer to build this school at 504 for the headroom, for future uh, needs. Um, um, and f uh, the uh, flexibility for future decisions that, that we might have to make. Uh, so uh, but, but if this town, because this town does from time to time say, that question is always comes up. Should we do the school completely as it needs to be done, or we should do what we can afford to do? And that is a debate that has been held probably for a couple of decades and will be held for another couple of decades. I'm only suggesting that the planning grant at least gives the various town bodies the information they need to say at what cost is that flexibility. Right. And just my final point on this is one, you know, I'll rehash. We've got the racial imbalance request, which we're, we haven't focused on the redistricting. We've made smaller steps, which haven't worked because now they're telling us in the spring of 19 we've got to redistrict. We have the overcrowding, which we haven't filled in. Uh, to do the redistricting so <coughs> even though we could redistrict in some areas to satisfy some of that we haven't done that and now we're going to redistrict based upon McLoone and McBroom's projections 
which I really want to have them come here to ask them some questions, um, which I, I, I also want another accuracy rate. So <laughs> the first two are solid facts. We're out of racial imbalance and we're out of, we're overcrowded. The next one is based upon their projections, which is the large variable, and that seems to be the one you're relying on. Um, we, we can't make up projections on our own. We need to turn to professional uh, firms that do projections across the state. Malone and McCroon is a well-respected firm in that regard, um, but um, their projections are projections based on a variety of algorithms that they can describe. Um, I, I would ask that if, if the Board of Selectmen thinks they want to listen to Mal Malone and McBroom, if then we did a third presentation, one before the Board of Ed, one before this board, a third one before the Board of Finance, and then a fourth one before the RTM, that if you're going to invite them in, you might want to consider inviting the Board of Finance and the RTM so that we aren't incurring uh, three times the costs. So just, just a suggestion. Okay. Well, I think we'd like to invite them in, and we certainly would welcome the Board of Finance and RTM to join us mm -hmm. in that. So why don't we work on arranging that yep. so mm -hmm. we can... Uh, I have one more. It's just a uh, process thing. At the last meeting, uh, we were told to sort of separate, the last board of selection, separate the Sherman project from the Mill Hill project because the Sherman project seemed to be closer to rolling, and we were closer to getting the ad specs on that. The Mill Hill seemed to be more work, and we have them here in the reverse order. The one which has the more question marks about the long-term planning and whether it's necessary or not is in front of us today. And the one we were told last week, we should be, you know, this is phase, was it phase three? We're doing phase three, we had phase two, we had, we've already done phase one. I feel like the Sherman project was presented to us last week that that should be the one which was rush to us and this one which requires much more long-term thinking would 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 still be in in the pipes and i don't see the sherman on the agenda and i see the mill hill one here is there a reason or a rationale um, why that happened uh, the uh, superintendent and the first selectman chatted about that certainly the larger i'll say more complicated project of mill hill in order to meet the opening date of when we want to have this school in use and you back up all the various steps that has to take be taken um, I think the two of them chatted about th we really have to get a start on Mill Hill in order to meet that end date four years from now Sherman being a smaller project probably could afford to wait uh, a month for their review before the Board of Selectmen uh, but I think Mr. Tetro could yeah. comment I on think that, that as that well Dr. Jones and I talk and one of the, the things that came up, and that's, it, remember last meeting I'd asked for a timeline in terms of what the approval process is, how it comes together. And the timeline I'm looking at here, um, we'll, well, we'll come back to that. But the issue is this. No matter when we approve, we approve both of them tonight, or we approved uh, them as we've laid them out. And the sequence is really what Dr. Jones laid out. Just And the the important point for me was just that we discussed them separately so we didn't get two projects on top of each other because this meeting's going to go on long enough if we had another project on top of this that right. that would be tough for the parents to sit through all this as well as for us um, but there's no board of finance meeting in March to review these so they go to the board of finance on April 3rd so no matter when we review them or approve them between now and March 21st would be our last meeting they still go to the Board of Finance on April 3rd. So we're doing one today, one on March 7th. Okay. And they still get to the Board of Finance on April 3rd. So we're not part of the critical path. The okay. Board of Finance has set that up uh, to be that. That's a good answer. Okay. <clears throat> um, all right. So if, if we're done on the Ed spec, spec, do we want, Tom, do you want to pick back up again? Yes. Thank you. So. The next item from the letter is the timeline, which you just brought up. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, provide a project timeline for Mill Hill Elementary School capital project. So we provided a timeline to you. And Tom, with your permission, since the timeline seems pretty straightforward, I do have a couple of questions on that. If it's okay with my colleagues, sure. Go ahead. Go ahead. 
uh, and it relates specifically to the Board of Finance timing on this, that uh, one, A, thank you for laying this out. This is just what I was looking for, because I want to make sure that we're in agreement. And because of all the cards, letters, emails, and phone calls we get from the parents, that the parents understand what the timeline is for approval on this. Um, so starting, this has in March, Board of Selectmen approval. Um, and let's just say okay with that, because we'll get it through part of that. It has the Board of Finance approval and RTM approval in March. Those two aren't going to happen. The Board of Finance doesn't happen until April. Mm -hmm. The RTM uh, can't happen until at least April on that. Um, now, it also has, you know, the building committee hiring the architect uh, in April. And the building committee will, won't be approved until the end of April. And I'm going to ask my colleagues that, that basically we go out uh, to the public and ask for volunteers for both building committees um, starting in the next week or so so that we can give them 30 days to kind of respond and we can get them on our schedule and then our RTM schedule in April so we can bunch through. But even at that, getting the build committee formed before April, we won't have them on the March RTM meeting. Getting the building committees formed before the end of April would be hard. So the architect is not going to be on till. And it's going to take some time in there to hire the architect. There's going to have to be another yeah, do RFP, RFP, go out. That's a 30-day process, roughly, maybe not exactly. <coughs> then some process, a couple weeks to review the responses when they come back. So, but if, if hiring the architect is 60 days, that's from May 1st on, let's say. Uh, that, that bumps all these other things out. So my, my question is, you can easily redo this, so that's not yeah. a critical item. My concern, are there any critical dates between now and June 30th that we have to meet that because yeah. of the revised time schedule would be, make that difficult? I think generally what we wanted to show here is that uh, Sal and I working on this are figuring it's about a 16-month process uh, to get to the funding approval piece and file to the state of Connecticut. And our goal would be to try and do that uh, before June 30th, 2019. Okay. As long as as long as these dates and these months don't matter, they matter. Right? But your, your sequence is. I'm not quibbling with your sequence. I'm just yeah. saying the dates don't matter because we're several months off in in the timing of this, based on when you start bumping things. As long as that's okay and that doesn't hit a critical yeah. path for you. Right. Uh, yeah. Um, Sal Morbido again. Um, as we've seen in the past, uh, especially with Holland Hill, because they ran into a small hiccup. The building committee uh, works uh, double time sometimes to, to make up something that's not quite in sequence so that they can hit their date. Um, as long as you have a dedicated building committee, which I haven't seen one that isn't yet, yeah. um, you, you can definitely make these dates. Yeah, my concern is more about it's going to take a couple of months it to it will get be us where we want to Two go. months longer than you project here for us to get the building committee in place. Right. It'll be two months longer than you project here to get the architect in place want to make sure that we're not missing any design deadlines, anything else on that. If we're not, that's okay. I'm, I'm going uh, to ask you to update out. this, but I just want to make sure we're not missing any critical sure. dates. Sure. Um, okay. and then right offhand, uh, the critical date to, to catch, as, as Tom said, um, uh, June 30th, uh, 2019, um, that uh, we want to make sure that we hit that as long as we're established before this June, um, we're in good shape. Okay, with that, and then the, um, say going forward, if I could, just ask, let's talk about this before it gets here, so we can kind of go through those dates so that, that the board's comfortable with the approval process, so we know what our obligations are, because A, we don't want to miss our obligations, and B, we don't want to misrepresent anybody else what the, what the approval process is going for. All right. Thank you. Any comments from my colleagues? No. Good on that. Next up. Uh, actually, you know, oh, sorry. You know, right based upon the timeline and the late start we're getting here, um, and hearing what I just heard tonight, that uh, folded into approving a 504 school will be a redistricting conversation to be had at a later date. I, I feel like that conversation uh, should have been had in the fall. I feel like it should have been presented that if Mill Hill is going to turn into a 504 school, the next step would be to redistrict in the spring of 19 per uh, the racial imbalance plan from the state of Connecticut. Uh, 
and that's something I'm seeing right now. I feel like we're, we've missed an entire community dialogue on what the 504 actually means for the future of t the town. Uh, Phil Dwyer, uh, Chairman of the Board. Um, a full community dialogue is a couple of years long. We actually had a mini dialogue this past fall as a result of electing uh, five new members to the Board of Education at various debate uh, venues. Uh, the conversation came up around redistricting. I'll say seven years ago and three years ago, uh, the responses by various candidates was, no, we've never redistricted and I'm not going to redistrict. This past fall, uh, the conversation by candidates um, uh, who eventually were elected was for uh, space utilization at various schools. That's something we have to give a serious look at. So the, I'll say the conversation has changed uh, since last fall. Um, I, I don't want to say it's not if, but now it's when, I think is where the board is at the moment. And in talking to various PTAs, um, I think that there's a better understanding among a group of parents that for space issues alone, um, we may have to give a serious look at this. So, I, so I think I think some initial community conversation has taken place, but but that is one that you have to go um, school by school, PTA by PTA, chatting to them about the impacts, uh, plus and minus, and building community support for, and. Um, and, and quite frankly, I, I would disagree with you to say, do that, and then the town will decide whether you're gonna have a 504, and you might decide to have not a 504 just based on financial reasons. And we will have created a set of scenarios in the community that will never, never come to pass. I would rather have a plan that says, okay, we can do a 504 at Mill Hill, that then allows some of the scenarios that we're looking at to take place, and then you choose which one or two, three scenarios you're gonna have, and then march that through the community. I, I honestly think that that is the better sequence. So approving a 504 tonight would be telling the community we're, we're anticipating a redistrict? Uh, if they listen to this meeting, the answer is yes. Okay. <laughs> And, and we've had limited discussion at actually <coughs> Board of Ed meetings, um, uh, but I would say the answer is yes. Well, I mean, I would rephrase that. I mean, approving this tonight at 504 doesn't necessarily mean that this board or anybody in this room is signing up to redistrict our Correct. children. Correct. Um, as I understand everything that's been said, approving this at 504 tonight in conjunction with what was done at Holland Hill and what has been done with other schools mm -hmm. gives us the global flexibility to address a number of issues down the road in more than one way. Correct. Right? That's a far better statement. Okay. Um, and I don't know what all those options will be at those times or what they will be based on mm -hmm. and what the outcomes will be. But providing the flexibility and the options to understand them and be able to react to them and implement something is how I would see that vote, personally. Correct. And there are multiple issues that the Board of Ed will have to deal with in making that decision. It's not a, based on this fact, this will be the decision because there's a variety of things that will be taken into consideration. Okay. So there's no doubt, though, if we don't make that next decision to do something dramatic, we are we are overbuilding Mill Hill by at a large number on this. And we are we are if, if we don't do that, we're overbuilding a school. I wouldn't make that statement. I know you've made it, but I would not make that statement um, based on what I perceive to be the future needs of space in this school district. But based on enrollment, based on program, um, I don't, I, 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 I just, uh, I, don't I honestly <laughs> believe that um, five <laughs> years from now, when that building is a 504, this town will be glad they have the flexibility to do certain other things because of that, and that they weren't short-sighted. I honestly believe that. I know the numbers don't support that, Mr. Timniak, yeah. and I uh, understand your concerns, but 
I think if we're planning for the future, which is a 20, 30 year future, um, somebody's going to say, that was a smart decision. And that may be so. We're making that decision tonight. Correct. At the, I've been told by the audience, we're not making a decision tonight on voting on a 504. Well, you're voting to plan for a 504, and then once that plan is put in front of you for full funding, I'll say you have a second bite at the apple. I think that's a better way to say it. <laughs> well, in essence, right now, all things go as planned. We're giving them an ed spec. We're going to write a charge for the building committee and say, build to this ed spec. That ed spec says 504. Right. If something traumatic happens and they can't do that, then right. perhaps we have a second bite. But right now, that, those are the instructions we're giving the building committee. Uh, and that's one of the questions that came out of our last meeting was we need to know what the Board of Ed is asking us to do. Yeah. We need to know what they're asking the, the building committee to do so we can both review the ed specs properly uh, and write a charge to the building committee to tell them to do that. Okay. Thank you. Right. Mr. Collin, I think we're back to you. What's okay. the next? So the timeline we're completed with. Um, the next item. Um, in the we, will, we will get a revised timeline though, just yes. so we can manage through that. We okay. can do that based on what's actually happening now. Yeah, I, don't, I don't want to hold this up. I just timeline. want to make sure you get back to us. Yes. Okay. What's next? The next item in the letter uh, would be item six. Provide the plan for school population capacity projections related to the two school projects. So we provided for you the first Maloney McBroom uh, study was an elementary school facilities and scenario planning report. It's dated October 24, 2017. The second report was a Maloney McBroom Fairfield Public Schools 10 year enrollment projections. Um, we needed this for the project. The state will require at least an eight year projection when we file. Uh, and then the third uh, report was Maloney McBroom Fairfield Public Schools enrollment projections facilities and scenario planning report dated February 13, 2018. And that was the one that they also used to do a presentation to the board um, and did a wonderful PowerPoint, an hour discussion, and we will get them to come here and do that also. So that was everything I took from the meeting minutes nope. and the discussion. And again, Tom, I think this was yeah. very good, and I want to thank you for that. I think that it's so good that we need a separate presentation. I don't want to tie up this project yeah. going through all this in detail. Totally understand. We've been living it because we've been <laughs> working with them. You're just seeing it right. for the first time. Uh, again, Phil Dwyer, Chairman of the Board, I would strongly encourage you to tune into FAIR TV and listen to their presentation because I think um, that will uh, make uh, your their visit here uh, more instructive to you and you might be better prepared to ask them questions based on hearing the presentation. Mm -hmm. That's very reasonable. You're going to send somebody will set us that link, correct? Yeah, because I don't know what meeting it was. Thank you. That. Yes. Thank you. Okay. So that was it for the the, the letter and response. Mm -hmm. um, we'll share that with you when we do Sherman also, because there's many things in yeah. there for the Sherman project. Can I ask a couple questions right about ahead. the building, right the school? <laughs> <laughs> I think we're I think we're to that packet. Are we? All right. Good. Uh, Tom, you mentioned or Sal with one of you guys earlier. You were talking about um, how the current how the building is currently constructed. We don't have the, the the building doesn't have enough of the smaller specialized spaces Correct. that um, other schools do, and that what our educational needs have determined that we should have in an elementary school. So, I mean, I know we're early in the process, but can you just talk a little bit about what your thoughts are, maybe from the superintendent, on you know getting this particular building up to that level so that it's you know it's as even as it can be with some of the other schools that have you know the proper size rooms yeah, if I you can, will they can tell you when there aren't enough small spaces the principal's forced to use regular size classrooms right and that's not other that's items. not an efficient so use of like space computer art room otpt right. um, whereas our other elementary schools have a lot of small <coughs> spaces that can do those items Superintendent um, in the report that you have from October of 2017 in the facilities and scenario planning one of the um, exercises we asked Malone and McBroom to do was to take the actual Holland Hill ed spec mm -hmm. and overlay that to Mill Hill so that we would know exactly where it was deficient and so uh, going into the building committee they'll have some really good information to actually inform them I think much much more so than we had for Holland Hill correct 
Okay. I mean, it, it, it's top level, but that's the direction that you are going to drive the project in, is what I'm hearing. For that ed spec? Yes. Yes. I mean, there was lots of discussion uh, last spring uh, on the ed spec, and I know the Board of Selectmen and also Board of Finance did walkthroughs mm -hmm. um, at River Field and then also at Holland oh, Hill, and one of the big questions they had um, was making sure that we were following the ed spec so that we would have equity in our elementary schools. Mm -hmm. So we've taken that same approach for Mill Hill. That was my question, right? right. Okay. And my other question is about affordable classrooms. And you called them something else earlier. Oh, what did you call them? Well, you, temporary you can call them learning cottages. You can call them all kinds of things. They're trailers. Trailers. That's yes, the word you I, use. All right. Well, we I'm haven't born and raised in Oklahoma, so maybe that's. We, we haven't used that term in Fairfield. It's right. Tony it's not a very flattering <laughs> term. No, I people like to call them other things, but that's really what they are. Right. So I wanted to quickly talk about that, and this certainly predates you and some people who have been around long enough may remember some of this. Um, when I was first elected to the board of the Board of Finance back in 1997. Um, I believe at that point in time, town-wide, um, we had close to 80 portables. It was even higher than that. We can't find the exact number. It was in excess of 80. It. I don't know, Phil, do you know the number? Uh, there's it. only a number that Tom traces to his first day, which was, I think, 2002. Six, July 61. 1st, 2002, I came, there were 61 portables. Right, but so prior to that, there were quite a few yeah, more than we're we, trying we to were, search that. Down. We were most definitely in the 70s or 80s at one point in time before we revamped the first high school. And, you know, we made a conscious decision as a town, as town bodies and as members of our government, to eliminate the use of portables over time as we could, as we could afford to, and as made sense. We didn't have the option to do that all on day one, and we chipped away at it over the years. You know, and we needed specialized spaces for music and art and special education and IT, things that some of these smaller classrooms will help accommodate when the schools are built efficiently to fit today's educational needs. And we need to get there. But there were years back when we had art on a cart and we had music in the hallway and we had all these other things going on in all of our schools and they were completely unacceptable. So, I mean, I'm, I'm happy to say that by the time Mr. Quinn's school is all done and those five portables are gone and these five portables are gone we will be down to one portable town wide if you don't count the one down on one ride highway which i don't because that really is a trailer <laughs> right but we'll be down to just the one portable school at jennings which is my school by the way and i think we've done a remarkable job as a town over time to you know, move our classroom spaces from trailers, portables, whatever you call them, into appropriate classrooms that fit today's educational specifications. So that's a big thank you to everyone that has worked on that for you know, 20 plus years. And it's, it's, it's where good we need point. to be. It's a good point and portables have gone up drastically in price. When I first came here in 2002, we were spending around 40 or $50,000 for one. They're now upwards of 350 yeah. plus. They're also made to last about 10 years, is what the contractor will tell you. They're mm -hmm. temporary. Yeah. We've had some that are almost reaching 20. And we're at a point where we're starting to replace roofs on them, redoing the decks and stairs, the siding, and we don't want to be putting money into portable temporary classrooms. Right. So, Thanks. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. No, I just wanted to touch on that topic. Just in terms of the approach, the first time we did uh, seed money this size was with Holland Hill. And, and that was specifically because they could not expand the school based on where the portables were located. As I'm reading the description here, this says that uh, best location for the addition on the site that may involve the relocation. Um, with Holland Hill, we had site plans showing that, that they really needed to, to move the portables. Uh, in our other school, like Riverfield, we didn't uh, move the portables or have to allocate $1.5 million first just for the design phase. Why is that approach being used here when it wasn't used at Riverfield? Well, we're thinking internally um, where they might want to put an addition. We can't tell them where it will go, but just from our background, we were looking at Mill Hill and saying, where do you think an addition will go? We did the same thing for Holland Hill. Um, we talked early on with the building committee and even didn't install and replace the kindergarten playground, which was behind the other side of the building, thinking that the portables might have to go there. And then when we included adding two more new portables, we specifically moved them out front. Normally we would have put them in a row with the other three because it makes more sense for the teachers and the kids getting in and out, but we knew they were gonna be in the way. So we did the same thing when we looked at Mill Hill. Mill Hill's a little bit more difficult. The school's kind of set into a hill. 
and the whole back portion has a double portable that's very old and then the triple portable we put in that's kind of in the way of doing a u-shaped brand new addition okay. um, so we wanted to make sure we had some funding in there for the request and for the building committee to possibly move maybe the two old ones we get rid of them and tear them down to make room or possibly move the triple unit uh, we're trying to help them when they do their layout and design and look at that so that was the intent of having some money in there for portable classrooms uh, because we believe they're in the way of a new addition and renovation okay but we've got um, on the quote here it looks like we've got only 250 grand for relocation yeah. yeah I'm just putting a small holding number in there in case they need to do something with them I'm sure the double unit which is very old is in the right. way but is that all that's allocated for the new portables the moving and getting rid of the old ones out of the 1.5 million well it's if we only have to demolish the two old ones and the principal can deal internally with those spaces that's going to be something that we probably can do with DPW's help they help us tear down portables and take them away there'll be no cost um, if we have to relocate them we're looking at moving cost okay um, when, when we're getting them up those temporary trailers <laughs> where's the where's the number in here that in this quote that it's the 250,000 it's just temporary portable classrooms relocation set up and take down moving relocation that line item on page 11 okay so that all can be done so for 250 my thinking was the triple unit would be the only one we'd have to worry about that's my opinion the double unit is old they're falling apart our maintenance department has to do new decking this summer and some siding um, so I'm thinking those will go away and the triple unit may have to get moved uh, maybe behind the gym where we had portables before which was a basketball court to get them a little further out of the way um, I don't know until the project team looks at it but I didn't want to not put anything in and put a number for portables when we know looking at the site there's probably an issue and they're in the way yeah my question was really um, was I it enough understood money? Holland Hill it was a definite this seemed like a maybe I just um, just wanted to be clear on what the thinking was on that uh, then with respect to the contingency how did we get to that number uh, just really looking at what we did at Holland Hill which is a little bit smaller contingency um, I didn't bring that with me to put it next to it but I know we had a contingency for Holland Hill and we uh, increased it because it's going to be a couple years later escalation costs uh, the difficulty with that site uh, okay, what's that how much contingency and how much escalation uh, escalation we normally carry three percent a year but we corrected that from Gilbane's number on the last three projects told us to use closer to four percent um, okay so four percent of what four percent of the total construction project additionally to Holland Hills hold which I think was around 155 was the number but I'm guessing at that Okay, 4% of the 1.5 million? No. 4% of what? 4% of um, the uh, construction. I'll, I'll have to get that for you, I think. And that's and escalation for that. what? What's that supposed to account well, for? Well, escalation accounts for, we base these numbers off of Stratfield, Riverfield, and then Holland Hill, and we estimate how many more years it'll take before we get to this point and we have to increase an in escalation so normally we say see at the very bottom page 11 it says budget estimate is based on 2019 dollars so Holland Hills is yeah that's on next year 2015 yeah. or 16 I'd have to look it up so we would add on escalation based on the numbers we took from Holland Hill okay so is our contingency 10 percent on this what how do you how do you get to that number uh, it's really based on escalation you're guessing contingency what's your contingency percentage for this it's usually seven to ten percent I think we use okay did you use seven or ten I'll have to go back to all my breakdowns yeah okay just trying to get clear on what that is because most of this is planning 
Well, so it is gonna, we're concerned it, it's so more it's, difficult. It's not site. the typical construction contingency that you'd run into. No, and we, we believe it's a more difficult site than what we're used to dealing with. Okay, so that's really a 10% contingency for yeah. um, the civil engineer and the park <coughs> landscape are in and that we're finding out now that the water lines coming into the schools are so old they need to be replaced have a separate meter room for them we weren't figuring things like that um, the ledge on that site is evident in several locations um, drainage we've had drainage issues with everything coming off the road and down the hill into the school we've done some curtain drains but it isn't helping as much as we would have liked to see so based on it being a more difficult site we're concerned about some of those things on top of having a contingency for the project and this piece of it. So we looked at Holland Hills, which was <coughs> 1.24, uh, and increased it based on a few yeah, of those I just My concern is going into that, that, that for all those reasons, this doesn't seem like a very big contingency number. Uh, if there's that much uncertainty. I'd be happy if you wanted to increase that. Well, I'm looking for your recommendations so since you put can, this together. Mr. We Collins. will certainly pull our notes together and tell you how much we increased it, what percentage, and, just and then a list of the things we thought. And about. just so you're clear, when I looked at the Sherman number, it was less than this. So since that's a $3 million construction project, I would have expected to see a higher contingency since this is a $1.5 million planning project. Right. Um, so I, my question next week or next time we get together will be, how did you get to the Sherman contingency we'll number and for you. why is that 150000 the right number? Yeah. Any further comments from the team? No. Yes. Good. Chris? Good. All right. Mr. Cohen, anything else you need to take us through? Uh, no, I think that, except if you look at the pictures since we put them in there. For page 12 and 13, 14 and 15, which gives you a good view if you haven't had a chance to walk the school recently of uh, where the portable classrooms are located and gives you an idea of the terrain of the property. hopefully answers all of the questions you might have related to the site. Thank you. Okay. Any just further quickly, questions and reports? If I looked at the pictures, where are the solar panels? Is it, are they in any one area? Can I, can you? Yes. Oh. Just. I actually, they, they would be on this wing. If you hold on, I have it on my camera. No, that's okay. I I but they're, okay. they're over here, they're not over here. Correct. Okay, thanks. Okay, go to the public. Sure. Sure. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tom. Any comments from the public? Please, just please come up to the mic, introduce yourself. <laughs> <laughs> just introduce yourself with your name and address if you would be so. Kelly Acker, South Pine Creek Road. Um, I encourage you to following up on uh, watching the Malone and McRoom Fair TV link that they're going to send you. In that you'll find a lot of um, answers to some of your questions. One thing I would note, they talked a lot about persistency ratios and they talked about how Fairfield, even though maybe birth rates have declined, Fairfield has such an influx, a migration of families with kids ready to go to school. So that's in there in addition to other explanations. Um, I also wanted to say <coughs> that historically, if you look back at Mill Hill, just 10 years ago, um, we were at 479 and in the 400 so I know Melinda McBroom have projected 384 but we it wasn't that long ago <coughs> excuse me we were pushing into the 500s so thank you thank you any other comments from the public <coughs> Kelly Jacobson um, Acorn Lane uh, just listening to the discussion, I guess um, I had sent you an email earlier just with um, some some of the concerns as to why um, both myself and I think the community at large feel that um, the Mill Hill renovation is something that's pressing. And, and your kids, if I remember the email properly. Needs to be, uh, yeah. sorry, my kids, yes. yes, the community, the kids, the staff. And I guess just in listening to this discussion and um, perhaps the request to um, bring Malone, Malone and McFroom back, that um, maybe if we could just kind of look at what we have in front of us, which is an immediate need um, of our school,
to eliminate the portables, improve air quality, improve logistics, some different things within the school, and kind of look at the um, request for the $1.5 million exploratory team, um, kind of see that just having value in and of itself as equal to, more important than kind of getting the statistic, statisticians back in um, to try to answer some things because I feel like the value you're going to get from, from that exploratory stage is going to help you in so many ways kind of understand what's possible, what's not possible. And so let's not stop that from moving forward um, and kind of see the value in that because I feel like it's we've been trying to understand and address certain issues and um, as it relates to the town um, with racial imbalance and other things going on and um, and that could continue to take years even though I know there's some state requirements that are coming up but um, I just I hope that we kind of focus on the needs of, of Mill Hill at this point in time and not and not wait to address those needs um, in order to solve for many other issues um, and move forward with the um, approval of the $1.5 million. All right, thank okay. you. Thank you. Any other uh, comments from the public, please? <clears throat> um, Jessica Gerber, 25 Shady Hill Road. Um, I'm also a member of the Board of Education. I voted in favor of the funding request. I voted in favor of the ed specs. I just want to reiterate what um, the previous speaker just said. What's before you right now is a funding request for $1.5 million. And I would strongly suggest that if you haven't seen or if you <coughs> haven't read the minutes of our December 12th and January 9th Board of Education meetings where we discuss this project, or you could also listen to our February 13th meeting um, to hear us discuss at great length the fact that this is not committing this project to a 504 school. Yes, it's in the ed specs for now, but the board made it abundantly clear that we can amend these ed specs. We amended the Holland Hill ed specs a year after we initially approved them. So we can certainly amend these ed specs. What's important to remember is that the $1.5 million is needed whether we do a 504 school or a 378 school or anything in between. That this funding is needed to provide the guidance for what the scope of this project will be. So I would just strongly ask you to please, please not delay this project because any way you look at it, Mill Hill needs this work. It has five portables. One is 18 years old, one is 17 years old, and three are 10 years old. The average lifespan of a portable is supposed to be 10 years. So if you haven't toured Mill Hill, I would strongly suggest that you tour it. Um, they are able to make do with some of the spaces or lack of proper spaces they have for services because their enrollment has gone down somewhat. But a few additional sections and they will be right back where they were, where they were giving OT and PT on the stage in the APR. They were having services in art supply rooms, in hallways with you know, a, a sheet around students for privacy. That is not the way we want any of our schools or any of the students in any of our schools to, to have their educational programs. So, I ask that we not get wrapped up in the 504 and the racial imbalance or all of those other things. Yes, those are topics to be discussed and I would say that we had a very long and very healthy discussion on redistricting and racial imbalance when Malone and McBroom first came to us two years ago. That presentation is on the Board of Ed website so you could certainly look at that as well. Um, and then the February 13th presentation, it's February 13th, it's on Fair TV, it's already up so you can see that presentation as well. I would strongly suggest you watch that as well because it does give you a lot of information but at the end of the day the 1.5 million dollars will be needed no matter what the size of the school is and we have five aging portables at this building if those five portables go away this school will be going back to giving services in inappropriate spaces which I don't think anyone here wants so thank you any further comments from the public Christine Vitale 254 Vernon Hill Road also a member of the Board of Education, newly elected. That's going to be hard to beat. Um, but I just want to reiterate everything that Mrs. Gerber said. This money, we need the seed money for this. Um, just to move the project forward for the Mill Hill community who has been waiting for a very long time to just have core improvements to this, for the children that are there now. Forget about who's coming down the road in the next 5, 10, 20 years. For the children that are in that building right now. The school needs work, the Board of Education and the town needs information. We're not going to be able to get that information unless you approve the money that's before you today. So I'm asking you please for the support, stage one, 
and this project will be before you again when we're asking for the remainder of the funding. So thank you. Okay. Any further comments from the public? Seeing none, back to the board. Any further discussion from the board? Yeah, yeah. It, I, I certainly hear everything you're saying and I'm, I'm really wrestling my head. I, I absolutely understand the needs uh, and the need to <coughs> renovate Mill Hill. I'm, I'm just, I'm very, I'm very conscious of, of overbuilding and um, I'm nervous that the Ed Specs does go ahead and outline uh, a 504 school without the steps uh, the steps in place to back that up. I'd feel more comfortable um, in in voting for for had we had those steps uh, in place. Uh, it's a vote. I, I, I you know I'm not taking lightly. Uh, I, I do spend a lot of time at Mill Hill. I, I'm I'm very conscious of of overbuilding right now in the town, and um, I think that's my my rationale. Okay. Kylie? Sure. Um, you know, thank you to, for everyone for um, being here tonight. Um, for me, it boils down to a couple of things. Um, the first is flexibility. You know, I'm seeing this project as um, giving us the flexibility to look at look at it again in six or twelve months to determine is 504 the right number or not. Um, but by moving forward with the 1.5 million today, we're going to allow ourselves to understand what those options are and to know what that flexibility is and what we can do down the road if we need to do anything to tweak the project or to uh, modify the specs, the school, or, our, or, or other components. It also gives us the flexibility to help solve the overcrowding problem across our town. And um, while some of that problem is driven by where we currently have children in seats today and some of it is driven by the state of Connecticut, Nonetheless, it exists, and we need to address it and solve that at some point in time. So having, having some global flexibility to, to address those issues in a very you know, community-involved manner down the road as we need to, uh, getting proper input from everyone who has a say or wants to be heard while being fair uh, to all of our students and families and providing quality education, I think that flexibility is also very important for us to have. And this provides that as well. Uh, thirdly, and the last couple speakers touched on it, and I tried to touch on it before with the facility itself, the school needs work, okay? You know, whether it's a renovation, a facelift, a full-blown project that we're looking at tonight, there's no question that the school is inadequate as we expect our schools to be today in Fairfield, Connecticut. We've got portables, we have other issues with the facility, the building um, that need to be addressed. So we're going to address them with this project if it goes through town bodies. And you know, for the children that are there today, the ones that will be there next year, the year after down the road, it's important that we upgrade that facility so that it meets the standards of our town. So for those reasons and many more, I will support the project. All right, thank you. Um, I want to thank you to everybody, and again, I want to uh, thank uh, Mr. Cullen and his team, or superintendent, and your whole team for uh, putting together the packet, and, and that was uh, much more complete, much more thorough, and, and literally had more than we could review today. So thank you very much for that. I think a couple of thoughts. Is, is with, one is that they're uh, both in the emails and in, in some of the speaker comments about the amount of work that the school needs today from uh, one mentioned uh, drinking fountains not working properly, lead in water, some other things. Uh, this project is going to be a two or three years before we have a final design and four or five years before it's complete. Uh, I guess my request to the superintendent would be to please take a look at what we can do in the school right now to address these issues or to clarify that they're not issues. I mean, a lot of times things come up and I realize that every one of the emails I got may not be 100% accurate, but there certainly were some serious concerns pointed out and I forwarded you a couple. I will go back and forward you the rest, but I would ask that you please take a look at what we can do right now to address what I'll call the maintenance issues in the school um, so that the parents are concerned. Because in five years, the kids that are in the school now will not be in the school. So uh, in response to that. Uh, second, and I think somewhere in here that, that we need to coordinate um, or come to agreement or if something like this comes up in the future, we need to talk more before there's a proposal before us. 
when there's a proposal before us, we're looking for ed specs, we're looking for the Board of Ed to tell us what to build. Um, I thought I understood what the superintendent said earlier in terms of we're building what I'll call system-wide capacity over and above what individual projections may be. To hear that the Board of Ed may come back and change the, the specs, then my question is what would they change them based on? What decision isn't made? I think that um, we really need to know from the Board of Ed what you want us to build before it gets to this point or talk about how we sort that out during the project before we get something like this. When it gets to this point, we're looking for um, ed specs to say this is what we want built. Um, I think, and, and it, to be fair to our building committees, we give them ed specs, we give them a charge, and we say go build. We don't say go evaluate. We say go build. Um, and if we're going to have them do an evaluation phase, or have them coordinate with an evaluation phase that's taking place at the Board of Ed, it would be helpful to have that in the timeline so they understood, or the architect understood, to develop two different models or three different models based on what populations may work. Um, but I think that's just a part of how we can work together better to make sure that we're kind of on the same page getting to this point. Um, you know, I buy the, the overall system need. Uh, having read through these uh, documents, I still would like the presentation, but the, certainly laying out the different scenarios here, it lays out that we do need the capacity based on what happen, happens not in this district, but in other districts if we shift school population from how we do that. I think there were things mentioned about closing down Dwight, closing down Jennings. Those are all good in terms of discussion points, uh, but when we get to this point in a project, we're asked to approve money to hire an architect to go design something, we owe it to the building committee and the architect to be able to tell them, here's what we want you to build. Um, so I think we've got to do some work on how that goes. I will support this for that, because I, I believe overall we need this, and I believe that um, the you know school definitely needs to get uh, renovated, and the sooner the better, and even though it's uh, three, four uh, years down the road, we've, if we don't get started now, we don't get started. Um, but, and this is certainly a perhaps more complex school building project than some that we come across. So maybe some of the issues or questions I'm raising are not the norm. They're not the thing we will deal with all the time. But um, we are certainly looking, I think, for firm discussion and firm instruction back. We may disagree with the Board of Ed, but it would be nice to know what we're exactly being asked to do from, from that standpoint. Um, any further comments from the Board? Uh, I would add, uh, to what you said, um, reiterate the fact that I, I, I believe that the work needs to get done. I believe there's lots of question marks right now. Um, as a member of the Board of Selectmen, I do want to have an opportunity to talk to McLona McBroom about the projections. And, um, you know, I, I mean, this is, a, this is going to be, uh, it, it's tough to, to vote on this one. Um, the way I'm voting, my gut tells me that I want these answers before I commit to doing, um, to doing the school at the level which is being presented in the future. So, um, you know, tonight I'm I'm going to not support it. Uh, look to get more information and uh, see how the information comes in, and when the actual funding request comes in, really, really analyze um, where we're at and what we've learned over over that period of time. Any follow-up comments, Kevin? I'm good. All right, ready to vote? Yeah. All in favor? Aye. All opposed? All right, thank you. And thank you. Superintendent Jones, thank you for your team and what everything went through. Oh, we have to go back oh, to 9. Yep. Just for yeah. yep, no, it's there. It's there. Um, so, may I have a motion to untable? I'll make a motion. Item 9, get that back before us. Thank yep. you. Mr. Kiley? Second, second that. Thank you. So item nine, the three phrases are before us. We discussed those briefly before. Any further discussion? Uh, Go right ahead. I, I, this is something I, seeing that the last yeah. one passed, uh, I would be foolish not to go ahead and try to advocate for state money on this, so I will be supporting that. All right, thank you. As long as we're talking about state money, any updates, Mr. Cullen, on the um, reimbursement percentages? Anything in the governor's recent proposal? Any rumors up in Hartford about what has happened? <laughs> uh, Sal Morbido, manager of construction, security, and safety. The reimbursement rates stayed the same this year. There were a couple provisions for new construction, brand new out of the ground, uh, clean sheet of paper. Uh, 
that would go into effect a year from July 1. Um, and speaking with the folks up at um, Office of School Grants, um, the, they're actually not too warm with those provisions anyway, and those might change yet again. So there's nothing that's uh, cutting our percentage down from what we typically get, which is in uh, it's 26 point, I believe 29 is the last uh, math that came out for that rate. Okay. Any further questions from the board? No. Any comments from the public on this item? All right. The item's back before us. Ready to vote? All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Thank you. And thank you again. Uh, next up, item 11 to hear and consider and act upon the following resolution from the Clean Energy Task Force. Resolve that in accordance with a request from the Clean Energy Task Force, the Town of Fairfield Sustainability Plan B and hereby is approved. May I have a motion to so accept? Moved. A second. second. All right, thank you. Mr. Thompson. Oh. We, we, want, I don't know. we want you to be sustainable too, don't get hurt. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, uh, Scott Thompson, uh, Chairman of the Clean Energy Task Force. Uh, thank you for having me tonight. Um, the first item we have is the, uh, to request your support of the uh, sustainability plan that we uh, published last month. Um, we started working on it about a year ago. Uh, we had several rounds with uh, the first selectman and Ed Bowman, who's our uh, our uh, champion here within Public Works. Um, and then we went to uh, all the town departments, uh, got their input on the sustainability plan. Um, and uh, we then, after putting it out uh, on the website, we held some sessions with the public um, in late January, early February to uh, get their input and feedback. Um, it was very interesting conversations we had with the public. Uh, we are here to um, to state that the sustainability plan is a it's an aspirational document. Uh, there's nothing in there, if you will, that's binding. Uh, but we are seeking to use it as a tool to engage uh, the public on uh, ideas that they can have and actions that they can take to go green. Um, as well as uh, as our town and to try to continue to foster uh, sustainability within the town of Fairfield and its operations. All right, thank you. Any comments from the board? I, uh, Scott, I think you're doing a remarkable job. Uh, I love to see all this energy efficiency going throughout the town. Um, this is a good plan. I looked at it. Um, one comment I had, I didn't see the members of the sustainability task force listed in the plan. I think they should be included in this so everybody can get credit for what they did because this um, this is this is a complete plan, something I think the rest of the state or other towns in this area <coughs> should look to model afterwards. So um, it's just a thought yeah, I had. Yeah, that's a great comment. And we, uh, we include the list of uh, about 25 contributors in the public presentation that we give, but that's a great comment. We'd be happy yeah. to put it into the document. I sure. think it should be in there. Mm -hmm. Credit <coughs> is uh, is due and should be shared amongst your group. Yeah. So. Mr. Kyle? And there's a lot of credit to go, to go around, so thank you very much for everything you've done and that you continue to do uh, for our town, uh, creating awareness, creating savings, um, doing the right thing for the environment. We, we certainly appreciate that. And as Mr. Timiak just said, we are a model. I mean, the, the town of Fairfield is a model for the state and for most of the states across the country with what we're doing and how we're doing it and the effort and energy that we're putting into that. So, um, you know, big thanks. Yeah. Scott, thank you for all your hard work. I know you and I have had a chance to meet uh, many times to go through this, and I appreciate your dedication to helping our town move forward. Can you talk a little bit about, this is our sustainability plan as it is now. Can you talk a little bit about your thoughts on as we look at getting involved in Sustainable Connecticut and what's because that's that statewide initiative uh, that a yeah. number of towns are getting behind. And yeah, so, so what, might, what the future may hold. Yeah, so this, the, the Town of Fairfield Sustainability Plan kind of lays out that vision, that framework. It also highlights, obviously, all the accomplishments that have occurred to date, um, largely in, in support uh, by this board. Um, Sustainable Connecticut is a program and we will have to uh, actually enroll into that 
and Bob Wall has been kind of championing that effort for our task force. He's here on the back, um, and Mary Hogue as well. We will go before the RTM to ask for a uh, resolution to allow us to enroll in that program, <coughs> uh, and that will give us access to this statewide network of uh, sustainability advocates and uh, other towns, as well as uh, technical tools and uh, kind of the uh, lifeline to all the grants and funding that might help make some of the projects uh, um, be more economically viable as well. Excellent, excellent. So we go before the RTM uh, on uh, the committee on March 19th, and then uh, for full approval, we hope, on March 22nd, uh, 26th to uh, be allowed to enroll in sustainable CT. All right, very good. Uh, any further comments from the board? No, good luck with that. All right, Thank you. Yeah. Good work. Any comments from the public? You have to come up here to the podium. Can you bring up sustainable County? Oh, okay. Yeah. So there's actually not to confuse things, well. but we have we have sustainable uh, Fairfield, right? Mm -hmm. Which is what we're the next item we're going to ask you to name our committee, sustainable Fairfield Task Force. There's the umbrella program, sustainable Connecticut. Uh, we got together in between. Uh, a group of towns, um, Westport, uh, uh, New Canaan, uh, and Wilton, and we formed Sustainable Fairfield County. And so we are already uh, beginning to collaborate on really um, what I'll call our events and uh, making sure the calendars don't overlap, making sure the events have unique themes to them so that we can uh, kind of create those uh, teaching moments and those ahas in the community on sustainability. So we formed that group in late December. Uh, we've invited every town in Fairfield County to join. We've already got eight more uh, towns that are interested. And so um, there's going to be a press release on that in the uh, coming weeks uh, announcing Fairfield County, sustainable Fairfield County as well. All right, thank you. Any further comments from the public? All right, <laughs> back to the board. Are we ready to vote? Yep. Mm -hmm. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, Scott, thank you. Item number 12, Clean Energy Task Force, to approve a name change for the Clean Energy Task Force and to hear, consider, and approve a change to the newly named task force. Okay, Scott, why don't you take us through that? So as a, a logical next step, uh, it's time to uh, retire the Clean Energy Task Force. I think it's been around for 12 years. And we are requesting uh, that consistent with our desire to implement uh, the sustainability plan that we just drafted and that you just approved and consistent with our efforts to join uh, the sustainable CT network uh, that we change the name of the Clean Energy Task Force to the uh, Sustainable Fairfield uh, Task Force and we've provided a new uh, charge uh, for the group as well. Um, very similar in framework um, to other charges that you may have and similar in structure to the committee that we uh, currently have. <clears throat> All right, any questions from the board? Can uh, the committee shall be consist of up to 20 members appointed by the first selectman. Can we make that the board of selectmen? Under membership? I don't have a, I don't have an issue with that. Does yeah, Kevin sound okay to you? That sounds fine. Scott? Sure. I, I don't have an issue with that. In fact, when I drafted it, that's how I wrote it. But then I was reminded that the Clean Energy Task Force had always been uh, uh, first selectment approval. But I have no issue with that. All right. Um, Mr. Timniak, would you make that a motion? Sure. I'd like to make a motion to amend the membership paragraph to say appointed by the Board of Selectmen, period. And that would be striking the first selectman. All right. Is there a second? I'm just reading it quickly. Hold on. A second. Right. Um, that amendment is before us. Any uh, further discussion? All right. All in favor? Aye. 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 So the item as amended before us. All right, any further comments? What is the name of the new committee? Sustainable Fairfield Task Force. That's where I was going. 
Should we um, amend the resolution to actually include the name that we're changing it to? That was going to be my question. It's at the top. Oh, the resolution. Yeah, no, yeah, the, the item. Yep, yep. Or, or just, just referring to this document. Is, is that enough? Because it says to approve a name change. And approve the charge. Okay. Um, yeah, I think by approving the charge, we are inherently approving the name change. Yeah. Uh, and okay. Sheila, if you'll make sure that's in the minutes what the name change was that we are okay. voting for, which is at the top of the charge. Got it. All right. Any further discussion? No. I'd like to read it. I think you're doing a remarkable job with all the stuff in Connecticut. It is, uh, it's becoming a topic which is hitting the mainstream. Uh, minds of Fairfield people I talk to, Fairfield residents I talk to, um, and the things you're doing are noticeable and they're welcome right now. So continue to do the good work, Scott. Thank you. Uh, all right, and then uh, any comments from the public? I'd like to just say, I will, can, I will can you? It is a team effort, so come on up, Mary. This is, this is painful watching you walk it up is. here. It's painful to do it, too. <laughs> So I'm Mary Hoke. I'm on now the Sustainable Fairfield Task Force. I'm also on the Forestry Committee. And I bring that up because um, the Forestry Committee is updating their uh, uh, Community Forest Management Plan. Mm -hmm. uh, in 2019, we're working this year to review it. But the town is updating their POCD. They're updating, we're working on a strategic plan. Um, and so this uh, task force has been reaching out to the group those different groups to work with those people as well as Shellfish and Harbor Commission are also updating their plans. So we're we're actually going to be working together to bring all these different plans to collaborate and uh, correlate to each other with sustainability, which to me is bringing efficiencies um, to the town, which is a way of uh, helping the environment, helping the economy, helping our community. So I think that um, our work on the sustainability plan right now is, is just so timely, and I'm, we're just really excited to be able to work with all these wonderful people in town. So, that's right. it. Mary, thank you, and thank you for all you do. Okay. Thanks. Right. Any further comments from the public? I'll take that as a no. All right, back to the board. Are we ready to vote? Yes. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Congratulations. Congratulations. You have a new title and a new church. Okay, thank you. And uh, for the <laughs> RTM meeting on Sustainable Connecticut, would you like me to come back, present that more in detail, and ask you for approval? Okay, good. Yes, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, item 13 from the Director of Community is postponed, uh, so we don't need to take any action on that. Uh, item 14 from the Director of Solid Waste and Recycling is also postponed. So we don't need to take any action on that. Uh, item 15, uh, and this is per our discussion on dates in the budget process. This is to approve the following changes to the Board of Selectmen budget schedule. Modify the Monday, March 26th budget meeting to include both budget deliberations and the budget vote. Item B, cancel Tuesday, March 27th budget vote meeting. May I have a motion to accept? Make a motion. A second. Second. Any further discussion? Everybody okay? Yep. All in favor? Aye. 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 It is changed. Item 16 and from the tax collector to consider and act upon tax oh, refunds is recommended by the tax collector in the amount of $460,993.39. May I have a motion to accept? I'll make a motion. A second? Second. The item is before us. Any Aye. discussion or comments? Go Aye. ahead. I mean, this is a big number this, yeah, this month. 460000 yeah. It's a very thick folder. I, I see believe our, our tax collector is here. Would you like some comment from Could that? we get an explanation for that so the public doesn't see us approving a... Yep, Mr. Kelly, if you would. <coughs> Kaczynski, sorry. Got the K right. Her, My apologies. Her, her whole case. Yeah, you guys that, both joined... It actually happens a lot. You joined at the same time. I get to... And that as well, yes. Okay, so I felt... It was necessary for me to be here because of this figure. Obviously, this is very out of the ordinary. What? Um, and thank you for sitting through all this to, oh, to this point. No problem. What? So what led to this was the the federal tax plan um, that happened back in December. So 
the majority of taxpayers in Fairfield, they, they did their due diligence, um, and this was the majority that, that escrows their tax payments. So they would normally would not have to come into town hall and pay their taxes. It would get paid through their mortgage. Um, they, like I said, they did their due diligence. They wanted to get their taxes, the taxes that they legally could pay, prepay ahead of time in the year 2017. They came in and paid because the timing of this, the, the escrow companies, they could not put together the payment and get it in in time. So they, they told the taxpayers, go ahead, come on in, pay your taxes, even though tip, typically the escrow company pays it. And the taxpayers trusted that the banks would not make the payment. The majority of taxpayers told us when they came in, I'm paying the taxes even though I escrow. The banks just said simply pay it, get a receipt, show the receipt to the bank, and then the bank would not pay. Um, so we took in approximately $24 million more in the month of December than we did the previous December. So that goes to show a lot of people took advantage of this. Unfortunately, about a million and a half ended up being overpaid. Many of the banks either did not coordinate. So the banks send their payment to a third party um, escrow agency. And for whatever reason, the communication fell apart. So we ended up getting around 300 properties overpaid. And we have to force the overpayment because there's, they're wiring us the money. They're sending us a file with thousands of properties. So we can't just pick and choose. It's, you know, we have to force the payment. And then at the same time, we can't just roll the money over because there is no um, future taxes yet. The mill rate has not been set. Plus, for the taxpayers to get their money back, we have to replenish the escrow account. We have to refund the banks. Whoever generated the overpayment by law is who we have to refund. So this figure here, the 400000 is just like the first large round of refunds. And you know we're working <coughs> diligent, diligently with the banks because by law, it is a three-step process. We have to get a signed application from the bank. Then we have to bring it to the Board of Selectmen for approval. Third step is we bring it to the Finance Department to cut the checks. So so if I can, just to be it stated as simply as I can, just to be absolutely clear, there's no tax impact of what we're doing. No. They're basically, we're refunding overpayments. Yeah, this was just it's a... It's more complicated than that based on what you explained, but we're yeah. basically refunding overpayments. No impact on the town, no impact on our budget. No exactly. impact on this year's revenues. Yeah, this was just an unforeseen um, situation because of the federal tax mm -hmm. changes, and it was a miscommunication by the banks and the escrow um, agencies that they use to send the payments, and we're just trying to get the money back to them as soon as possible for the taxpayers mm -hmm. to replenish, you know, get to to, re, to bring back their, their escrow accounts. So is this $450,000, is that the the total or are we going to get another one in two weeks for about 450 yeah again? for the next couple meetings there'll, there'll be other rounds okay and then does the taxpayer realize that this money is going back to the bank not himself yes and well anyone that calls um, we explain the process to them and then the other 24 million if the other 24 million in December revenues that were higher than the prior December those were really pay prepayments of April's tax bill that were acceptable. Yeah, January and April. Yes. Gotcha. Yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. Just quickly, I think you said it was it, it was about one and a half million dollars. So is this about a third of it? Is what you're saying? Yes, correct. Okay. Yep. Right. Any further comments? Just no. one one last question. Um, back to Mr. Timmyak's question about notification. Um, I know when they call, you're explaining it to them, but I doubt they're all going to call. So is there any thought to uh, some type of communication outbound to these affected people to help them understand the situation? Yeah, I, I could put a press release out. That's certainly whether on the department website or on the, uh, on the, you know, the main website, I could certainly do that. Is there some way to contact them directly, either by mail or by email? We, we could try by mail, that's possible. Okay, if you could take, I think that's what Mr. Colley was asking, if you could take a look at that so they don't yeah. have to think about it or discover it, but okay. if, if they could be notified. If that's logistically, you know, reasonable, I know you guys are under a lot of work. Yeah, I'll have to see else. if it's something that I could easily Getting it on do. a website would be a good um, second step or plan B if that is okay. not logistically feasible. 
Okay. All right. Thank you. Thanks. Any other You're comments? Welcome. No. All Thank right. you for coming tonight. No Appreciate problem. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Uh, next up, the Town Attorney Private Executive Session on Pending Litigation. Thank you. Thank you, David. Uh, we have a motion to come out of private executive session. I'll make a motion. A second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 We're out of private. We're back in the public session in private executive session. No motions were made and no votes were taken. Um, let's see. The item before us is the attorney's recommendation. Uh, any further discussion? Okay. All in favor of the attorney's recommendation? All opposed? Aye. Aye. All right. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. All right, and next up, to hear, consider, and act upon any other business that shall properly come before this meeting. None that I know of. None. Um, I have a motion to adjourn. Make a motion. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you.